It's 9 a.m. here in New York City. I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith, and this is Yahoo Finance Live. Here's what we're watching this morning. After his abrupt ousting from OpenAI, former CEO Sam Altman is heading to Microsoft. He is going to be joined by co-founder Greg Brockman. We are breaking down the fallout from a whirlwind exit, what it means for Microsoft and the AI landscape. And the U.S. dollar drops to a more than two-month low as traders double down on their belief that the Fed has reached its peak for rate hikes. Confidence is buoyed by weaker-than-expected econ data last week. The latest Fed minutes, they hit tomorrow, Tuesday. And stock features muted ahead of a shortened holiday week. NVIDIA's results are due tomorrow and are often seen as a key barometer for the broader market. Well, further down the road, things could get dicey. J.P. Morgan offering a bleak earnings outlook heading into the new year. Well, some big changes in the world of AI as Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella announcing that OpenAI co-founder Sam Altman and Greg Brockman will spearhead the tech giant's new advanced artificial intelligence team. Now, this comes after Altman was removed from his role as CEO on Friday. The board saying Altman had not been, quote, consistently candid with the board. The software developer has made strong progress to become a powerhouse in the AI wars by pouring billions of dollars into open AI within the last year. So, so much to break down here from the outpouring of support from some CEOs out there for Sam Altman and notably from Satya Nadella saying, I'm super excited to have you join as the CEO of this new group, Sam, getting a new pace or setting a new pace for innovation. We've learned a lot over the years about how to give founders and innovators space to build independent and uh, identities and cultures within Microsoft, including GitHub, Mojang Studios, and LinkedIn. And I'm looking forward to having you do the same here. Of course, Microsoft at the start of 2023, one of the major companies, the major company in terms of blue chip tech stocks that had poured or at least announced their ambition to pour billions of dollars in to open AI in effort to advance some of their own co-pilot systems, as well as just have a better play for their search engine, plus this AI powerhouse that they look to be able to produce and ultimately have a lot of that hinging on the Microsoft cloud play as well going forward. Yeah, exactly. And just putting a bit more uh, in terms of numbers around this and exactly the importance of this to Microsoft. Microsoft right now has about a 49% stake in OpenAI. So lots of questions just about what this move means in terms of that future relationship what exactly happens to that investment. But the fact that Sam Altman is now going to lead this newly created AI team at Microsoft clearly is viewed, at least from the street's perspective, as a win. We're looking at gains of just about seven-tenths of a percent ahead of the open. The stock had initially popped just about 2% on the heels of this. We also did see some pressure in Google, a rival here within the AI space, just in terms of what this could mean for the broader AI landscape. When it comes to open AI, lots of questions about the future of that company company and what exactly it looks like under a new leader. There was also a number of reports coming out over the weekend that a handful of employees, more than a handful of employees, will be following Sam Altman to Microsoft. So that certainly would change the dynamic with it, within uh, inside OpenAI beyond just the fact that Sam Altman would be leaving. So lots of questions just about innovation there, what exactly that is going to look like under new leadership. But again, the focus, I think, for more broadly speaking for investors this morning is Microsoft, the ability of Satya Nadella, the CEO there, to court, uh, to court Sam Altman in such a timely manner, I think largely viewed as a huge win here at this point. Absolutely. We also have a quote from Evercore ISI on the announcement of this, and it's particularly interesting seeing what some of the street has been saying. I believe we have that quote for our viewers to also take a look at here on the day, saying that while it remains to be seen how much brain drain there will be at OpenAI, we think the fundamental risk to Microsoft largely contained with Altman and the team on board. Now, here's what's also critical to remember, and we're going to discuss this with some of our guests throughout the day, is just the board structure and how much scrutiny that has taken on over at OpenAI, at least, where they really just have four board seats at this point in time. And so uh, that really particularly interesting to get some of the analysis from Wall Street and, and how OpenAI continues to operate at the board level, which that decision making cascades down, as we've seen throughout this leadership change to the rest of the business. All right, well, let's talk about what exactly this means for Microsoft, because Microsoft's move to hire ousted OpenAI CEO Sam Altman is sending the stock 
to the upside here this morning. Now, the move that we saw earlier, Jay, would have added about $50 billion to the tech giant's market cap at the open. We're now seeing a bit of a more muted reaction, up just about seven-tenths of a percent in the pre-market. For more on this, we want to bring in Rishi Jaloria. He's RBC Software Equity Analyst. Rishi, it's good to see you. So the first question, obviously, to you is how big of a win is this from Microsoft getting Sam Altman to lead their new AI team? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks so much for having me. Look, this is a huge coup for Microsoft. I think there's there's no getting around that. Um, I, you know, this is probably the most eventful weekend I've ever seen in my decade plus covering software. And the worries that I think everyone had is the pace of innovation would slow down. Some of the uh, AI halo around Microsoft that has been enjoying in its multiple, uh, you know, would start to dissipate. Customers would get worried. And I think by bringing in uh, Sam and Greg, right? And Sam is obviously the ultimate visionary when it comes to AI. Um, it's it's really the best case scenario for Microsoft, given everything that transpired since Friday. Rishi, I mean, like many of us out there, I, I imagine at some point over the weekend, you were probably squinty eyed into your phone early hours or late hours of the night and trying to figure out, okay, what does all of this mean for OpenAI's future, but as well for, for Microsoft, because this was about $10 billion that they were set to spend or earmarking to spend over several years to really further this investment in generative AI. How much of that perhaps do they get the opportunity to pull back at this point? Because uh, according to some reports by Semaphore, it really hadn't been uh, at least dispersed in full and, and perhaps not even keeping pace with how much investors expected it to be dispersed to this time. Yeah, from my perspective, I think Microsoft is kind of in a situation where they have multiple ways they can win. Um, obviously, they have this relationship with OpenAI is going to continue. Uh, I don't think that goes away. I think they will continue to use GPT, um, and and nothing's going to change there. However, will they will they put net new money to work at OpenAI? Um, that remains to be seen. And at the same time, obviously, they've already been working on their own uh, AI technology, and I think the pace at which um, Microsoft continues to develop their own tech that will probably be competitive with open AI. I think that will accelerate. So that's really how I see this playing out is it's kind of a Microsoft wins no matter what happens type of scenario. Rishi, when it comes to the win, how uh, Satya Nadella was able to get Altman on board in such a timely manner, I guess, what does that tell us just about the leadership, obviously, that we have seen under Satya Nadella and how this could set up Microsoft here for the next several years? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I think as much as we've all admired Satya, we have to admire him uh, even more now, right? Satya is the truth. Um, and and I, 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 how he was able to pull this off, I, I don't think any of us know. I know, obviously, he and Sam had built up a very close relationship over the past several years and absolutely over the past year. Um, and this was really kind of an out-of-the-box solution, right? I think what a lot of us were thinking is, Sam was going to start up a, a new venture. Microsoft would invest in that, and it would take years to recover. And in kind of one quick move, Microsoft is actually probably ahead now uh, versus where they were three days ago because now they're in more direct control of their own destiny, right? They obviously saw the OpenAI relationship, but the worry that people had is, well, as OpenAI goes, Microsoft goes, now you have Sam and Greg. And remember, if you read Stethia's tweet between the lines, um, there are other colleagues joining them as well. And I wouldn't be surprised uh, if there are going to be a lot of former OpenAI people who joined Microsoft as well. Yeah, you've got some reports out this morning. Uh, Wired and Kara Swisher reporting this, that there are other OpenAI employees, including one of the co-founders, Ilya, that have signed a letter and are looking to perhaps uh, look for some changes from the remaining board members or else they will res resign here and perhaps join Sam Altman, as you were just mentioning there a moment ago. So all of these things considered, say you're one of the other major players in tech that has made an investment into generative AI and, and now you've potentially missed the opportunity twice on some of the brain trust that's within OpenAI if there is kind of this flooding out of employees elsewhere. Where does that leave some of the other players that are trying to make sure that they still have some of the market share here? Yeah, it's going to be really difficult, right? I can tell you, look, I live in San Francisco. I can tell you firsthand, hiring qualified generative AI data scientists and engineers and talent is very, 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 very difficult. And, you know, the Microsoft is now a destination employer for um, generative AI engineers. OpenAI was that. 
I think, you know, this maybe even increases the gap between Microsoft and others that are trying to compete. That's not to say they can't succeed. That's not to say there can't be multiple winners. I truly believe there will be multiple multiple winners in general AI, especially when it comes to domain expertise. But right now, I think Microsoft continues to have the lead. And Rishi, when it comes to the reasons here behind the potential firing, there were reports just about the speed at which Sam Altman was moving within OpenAI, some questions just about security and whether or not those risks were being properly addressed. Now that he's on board at Microsoft, I guess, how do you see Microsoft potentially approaching this? Or would you expect them maybe to be a bit more cautious, given the fact that those risks within AI are still very prevalent and are still very much at the forefront of the minds of many of these investors? I do expect Microsoft to be a little bit more cautious, right? I still think the pace of AI innovation continues at this breakneck speed that we've seen over the past year. However, because now this is happening inside at Microsoft and it's not arm's length, which is how it was with OpenAI before, I do think there will be more guardrails. Um, you've heard Satya talk about how they Microsoft is committed to you know responsible and ethical AI, and I think that will continue. So I don't expect the rate of innovation to slow down, but absolutely, I do think there will be more guardrails around how AI develops within the four walls of Microsoft. You know, in terms of if those reports are true, what what that means for open AI, Recall that that you know the the next biggest player in this space, Anthropic, was founded by a number of ex OpenAI uh, employees who are kind of concerned around the commercialization and ethics. So it remains to be seen how that OpenAI versus Anthropic um, dynamic evolves. But yes, I absolutely, I think Microsoft will put some more guardrails around AI development in house. It, it still costs a lot of money for OpenAI to be run. There, there were some reports. Uh, Analy Analytics India magazine uh, had also looked into this and revealed OpenAI's losses essentially doubling since starting ChatGPT. We know it's what about five cents every time somebody perhaps run some boneheaded search on there and then tries to replicate that over and over again. $500 million a year is what they expected and kind of calculated the company is losing. Could go bankrupt by the end of 2024 if it does not find a way to have a better revenue model and have it pass through to some margins there as well. Is this a company without Sam Altman that exists at the end of 2024, at the end of next year, uh, if they're not able to have a better board structure and ultimately retain these employees? I, I think uh, OpenAI needs to make some changes, um, right? I mean, I think, you know, the board structure stuff and, and board members and board composition, that's all publicly out there in the market. But I also think, you know, OpenAI was kind of coasting on the purse strings of Microsoft. And, uh, you know, they were kind of able to invest as aggressively as they could without monetization, right? Like, let's be completely honest. I pay for ChatGPT for out of pocket. $20 a month is a very deep bargain compared to what, you know, the value that I'm getting out of it. Uh, and so I think they need to figure out, you know, how can they charge? How can they charge more? And I think without Sam and Greg and the rest of the team, that's going to be really difficult. So I think, you know, absent some major changes, um, OpenAI is going to look like a very, very different company. Microsoft, on the other hand, they have a huge, huge, huge balance sheet. They can fund whatever research and generative AI probably for decades with no problem, especially given how profitable um, Office and Windows and, and, and even Azure are. So uh, again, I think Microsoft ends up in a stronger position as a result. All right, Rishi Jaloria, always great to get your insight. Thanks so much for having on with us here this morning. RBC Capital Markets Thank Software you. Equity Analyst. Thanks, Rishi. Thanks. All right, well, it is a big week for NVIDIA as well as the company gets set to report third quarter earnings after the bell tomorrow. The chipmaker's blockbuster earnings report back in May sent a ripple effect through the market as investors bet big on the future of AI. NVIDIA shares are up over 200% so far this year. We're looking at gains of nearly 240% since the start of the year. So certainly a lot riding on this report, obviously for NVIDIA here, Brad, clearly for the chip sector at large, but you can also make the argument for the entire stock market. And we just mentioned the performance that we saw in shares following the results that we got back in May. In August, they also reported blowout numbers, yet we saw the opposite reaction in shares. So we saw a surge in May and June. We saw a plunge in August and September. We also saw that follow through, ripple through throughout uh, the broader market here. And there was an interesting note out this morning from Evercore's Julian Emanuel talking about this report, saying that the S&P is likely going to have a material move on the back of NVIDIA's results, whether or not that fortifies 
the year-end rally that we have been talking about, maybe anticipating here between now and year-end, that remains to be seen or still up for debate. So lots of important points to point out just in terms of how important this result is going to be for the broader market. And then also just getting a better read on the chip market right now, where things stand, especially on the heels of the restrictions, the U.S. curbs on AI chip exports to China, how big of an impact that's going to have on NVIDIA, specifically their data center business, but also what it could mean for the broader market here. Yeah, it's the artificial intelligence mentions and it's the data center business. Everything else you can perhaps just listen in. That will be some fodder for a side conversation. But at the end of the day, you think about where they're guiding for that January 2024 quarter. That's what investors are going to be looking at to see whether or not the biggest wave of the demand cycle for some of the AI chips as well as some of the data center demand, whether that is behind us or whether that is normalization and steadying that we're seeing at this point as well. And then additionally, China, because when we think about the GPU orders that they've also seen come from China and how some of that, from the streets perspective at least, has been front loaded, any kind of slowdown there on that order front could also impact the trajectory for the, the price action that we see in shares as well, because that's where investors will start to really price in exactly where NVIDIA still sees some of the international demand coming from, especially because here at home there have been such, uh, such restrictive curves that have been put in place, especially on the intellectual property design front for these chips too. Yeah. Also, we're watching shares of ZipRecruiter today after Wells Fargo initiated coverage with an overrate rating and a $15 price target saying its bet on AI gives a competitive advantage. Analyst Brian Fitzgerald writing that a further shift to online boosts companies like ZipRecruiter as it gains market share. You're taking a look at the new price target and it's an overweight rating at $15 a share there and uh, a ton to continue to track on ZipRecruiter, which over the course of this year, even as we've tried to figure out exactly where uh, and there you see the stock chart over the past five days. It's up by about 6% over that time. But over the course of this year as well, taking a look at the price action, it's, well, all right, well, I'll take a look at it <laughs> on my screen. As of right now, you're taking a look at, oh, year to date, it's up by about 20, or excuse me, down by 24% over that time, which just spells out how kind of volatile this stock has been, even with some of that 52 week in place as well here at this point. Yeah, I think a lots of questions just about what exactly the future of the labor market looks like. We yeah. certainly have started to see uh, a slowdown starting to take shape, although still by many metrics, a very resilient uh, labor market. But when it comes specifically to what this means for Zip Recruiter, certainly they have been able to withstand what has been a pretty uncertain macroeconomic backdrop up until this point. The fact that Companies are hiring, but not at the rate that they had been over the last several years. That would have an impact here on their business going forward. So a more cautious outlook, given the fact that there is a reduced number of job openings now available. Despite all that, though, Wells Fargo still seeing some upward potential here within this name with that overweight rating of $15 per target. They still think that given all that, despite all that, some of their investments within the AI space is going to be enough in order to give them an edge over many of their rivals out there. We'll All, right. See. All right, let's turn our focus to overseas, where Barclays is expecting another year of record profit in Japan. The bullish outlook coming as the Bank of Japan relaxed its yield curve control, the benchmark 10-year Japanese government bond yield climbing to a 10-year high, drawing increased investor attention. The Bank of Japan is expected to step back from its ultra-loose policy next year, signaling more opportunities ahead. And when it comes to exactly what Barclays is expecting here and another of record or an, another year of record profit in Japan, profit after tax could reach an all-time high if there is no material change in the market situation. In terms of the setup and what this means here going forward, Japan has finally come to the center of the radar of global investors for the first time in a while. Those are the words from Barclays head of their uh, Japan division. They're really seeing some investment opportunity overseas and seeing that movement that we have seen over the last several months continuing into the new year. Yeah, no doubt a, a move that Warren Buffett perhaps is happy to see, yeah. given his investments in some core Japanese trading elements and trading firms over the course of this year really kind of makes his thesis come to fruition there. But at the same time, you think about what one chief executive officer for the country, Kosuke Morihara, is saying, uh, Morihara, excuse me, is saying, saying that 
profit after tax could reach an all-time high if there is no material change in the market situation. Uh, he said this in an interview with uh, Bloomberg and saying that Japan has finally come to the center of the radar of global investors, Buffett included, for the first time in a while here. What's also particular to note here is the BOJ, the Bank of Japan, taking steps to really liberate the debt market um, and trying to put some more of the stimulus or at least uh, attention, I should say, into business and more competition from financial firms. Uh, and that could impact hiring as well uh, if they see more inflows and more demand, more volume coming their way. We also got to stay in Japan. Japan's Nikkei 225, 225 touched over 30-year highs before reversing course ahead of the market close in Tokyo. The surge was led by strong earnings from Tokyo Marine Holdings and news that Panasonic is considering listing its auto-related business. Japanese stocks have been jumping for the last month and some weakness in the yen. Now, investors are in wait-and-see mode as holidays are expected to slow things down in Japan as well as the states. Here with more on the moves in Japan's market, we've got our very own Jared Blickery. Hey, Jared. Hey, Brad. Thank you. And uh, let's take a look at what's been happening in Japan. By the way, this is our worldview here. You're going to see Tokyo close the day down six tenths of a percent. But as you said, that was uh, just after it touched a 30 plus year high. And this chart goes back to the late 80s. And uh, a lot of people here are going to be too young to remember, but there was a huge uh, Japanification meme that was going on around the world. I think uh, the Japanese real estate market was top tick when they bought our Pebble Beach over in California. But if you take a look at this, this is a 30-year consolidation. I'm just waiting for a multi-year handle, and then maybe we can see the break upwards. Uh, I say that a little bit tongue-in-cheek when you have a pattern that, this, that has gone on this long. It can take forever to play out. But just look at the results that we've seen this year. Year, uh, up almost 28 percent. And uh, this really hits home the interest rate differentials. You were just showing a chart a, a minute ago about the Japanese 10-year. That has traded to a high of 1 percent. Meanwhile, in the U.S., we are at 4.5 percent. So that explains a lot of uh, the interest. The interest rate differentials explains a lot of why the uh, money has been rushing into the U.S. to take advantage of higher yields. But now that Japan's yields are rising for the first time towards 1 percent in forever, there's competition. And so you don't have those dollar flows into U the United States Treasury market and the currency itself. Uh, that's a side story. Here's what I want to look at right now. These are Japanese conglomerates. Um, I don't oftentimes take a look at the Japanese stock market, but I think it's interesting to look at some of these names on a very long time uh, time frame. Here's a max chart of Hitachi, for instance. You can see this was underwater for 20 years and has only recently, I believe this year, climbed back into the green. Uh, take another issue here, uh, Mitsui. This is a stock that was stuck in a very tight trading range uh, for over a decade. I so tight is a relative relative basis or a relative term here. But you can see it just recently broke out to the upside. Um, here's another one. And you'll notice that Japanese stocks are named uh, by numbers instead of uh, letters. But you'll see Mizuho Financial, this chart, they peaked in the global financial crisis, never even made it back to about 20 percent of the losses. This reminds me of Citigroup or a European bank. So there are a lot of parallels throughout the world. Um, but a lot of this has to do with what's playing out in the currency market. And I'm going to show you a heat map of the Japanese currency versus a bunch of other currencies around the world. Anything in green means the Japanese yen is stronger. So what the only green uh, spot that we're seeing right now is the yen versus the Argentine peso. There's a big election over the weekend. We don't need to get into that. But they're tr they have a lot of trouble with inflation. And so I think it's notable that the yen has strengthened only against this one currency, which is worse. Then you take a look at to the downside. It's lost ground. The yen has lost 22 percent to the Mexican peso, 18.9 percent to Brazil. Even the stalwart uh, the, in, uh, over in Europe, the uh, uh, it's going to come to me now, the Swiss, the Swiss franc down 15 percent. So uh, a lot of this pot that's being stirred up here has to do with the interest rate differentials that I've ta talked about. But there has been no grand uh, meeting of the minds here where interest rates are going to have been allowed to float freely. And when that happens, I think there's going to be a reckoning in the Japanese debt market. But that's a uh, that's a topic for a later date, guys. It is. And we'll want to dig in with you <laughs> that with you in just a bit. All right, Jared Blicker, thanks so much for breaking all that down for us. Just about six minutes to go until the opening bell. We'll bring that to you on the other side of the break. Plus, the latest commentary from the street. You're watching Yahoo Finance. We'll be right back.
The market may have decided the Fed is done hiking rates, but that doesn't make it true. Still, strategists across the street are adjusting their year-end calls to account for better than expected economic data. Here with the latest from Deutsche Bank is Madison Mills. Hey, Maddie, what have you taken away from this today? Yeah, so there's this question right now about what this market is pricing in. Is it a decision from the market's perspective that the Fed is done? Is it November kind of seasonality, technically speaking here? Uh, I want to pull up this quote from Deutsche Bank this morning, putting it into perspective for us. They say that this unwinding of the impact of rates volatility and geopolitical risk is what we're seeing here, rather than a pricing in of any upside uh, to economic growth more broadly. And they really look at these three phases of the S&P 5 over the course of the past couple of months here. Uh, first, they look at kind of a garden variety slowdown in the S&P. Then they look at a little bit of a dip following some uh, rate hike volatility and then a third dip due to geopolitical risks. And if you look at kind of where uh, the top line number is for the S&P, you can see that we've just kind of corrected uh, and unwound the impact of those uh, decliners on the S&P over the past couple of months. We're not kind of in this uh, euphoric, beautiful post rally after those uh, negative impacts there. So Deutsche Bank's point is that we're just seeing this unwinding, uh, and you can see that in this chart we've got up here now. Uh, th these are the three phases of the S&P 500's correction over these past couple of months since June. But the last thing I want to note, you guys, is that these strategists say that the S&P is up 9% since its bottom three weeks ago. We're on track for the fourth week in the green. Uh, this could be the biggest November rally since November of 2020, which is when Pfizer announced the COVID vaccine. So that would be a huge... Mm -hmm. Uh, potential upside for November here. Matty, I think the big question here amongst many investors is how Deutsche Bank, for example, is looking at the recent gains that we've seen in a lot of these tech stocks. We had the Nasdaq coming off another weekly win. It's best week that we've seen since June. So how does this play into their overall argument? Yeah, so they looked at 63 sell-offs since World War II, uh, looking at kind of where those sell-offs left the overall market. And they say that the average stock here in the S&P is actually only recoupling uh, half of that sell-off. Um, but guys, I can't leave without talking about uh, the open AI story because I was glued to my phone all weekend. So I just <laughs> I'm forcing that into my hip because I'm so obsessed with this story. Um, Microsoft getting a startup here that wasn't even for sale by getting Sam Altman here. A lot of strategists, uh, including the Deutsche Bank folks this morning, saying that this is going to be really critical to watch in terms of the impact on year to date returns for the overall S&P with Microsoft holding the second biggest weighting, I believe, on the S&P. So a huge one to watch here. And I'm really interested heading into NVIDIA earnings tomorrow. Are we going to get some uh, commentary on Microsoft kind of getting Sam Altman here and what Satya Nadella's broader plan is going to mean for the S&P as we head to end of 23? Yeah, you would think so, just given the reports of what Sam Altman had been working on, looking to yeah. raise more funding in terms of what exactly that could do to reshape the landscape going forward. And we were actually talking to an analyst, Arishi Jaloria from RBC at the top of the hour, and he was just talking about how big of a win this is, obviously, from Microsoft yeah. overall, but the ability ability here that Satya Nadella displayed, able to act so quickly and get someone with a stature like Sam Altman here into Microsoft, that that's really going to give them the boost in terms of their AI development here for years to come. Yeah, I, I continue to be obsessed with how this ultimately puts pressure on the board at OpenAI yeah. to change, because the structure for the company, which a, a lot of people may remember, but perhaps is worth a reminder here, th there's the board of directors that essentially control OpenAI, the public charity that's the nonprofit arm mm -hmm. of this company. And then they wholly control AIGP LLC. Now, that eventually, as kind of a dotted line all the way around the rest of this hierarchy and, and kind of triage system of control, uh, eventually gets down to the capped profit company that is OpenAI which Microsoft is the minority owner in. But yeah. in between that, there's the holding company for OpenAI, there's the employees and other investors that actually own some of that holding company. So there's an entire structural shift that we might also see as a result of this, especially if they add on or feel the need to add on more uh, directors to that board as well, who eventually kind of give it perhaps more of a wholesome view.
That's such helpful context, Brad. I want to go back and listen to that and draw out like a little graphic. Here, chart. I got it for you. Here, you can have yeah, my. Yeah, uh, hand me right. your notes, please, because right I love there. that. But no, it's so it's so. Oh, he's got it. He literally has it. That's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, we're gonna have to animate that out. But it is it's so interesting to watch. And to the credit of the board, I mean, they stuck to their guns this weekend. They didn't change their mind on Sam. So I can't wait for the Netflix doc. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. All right, Maddie. Thanks so much. We need to get to the opening bell here on Wall Street. And just about a minute into the trading day, two minutes into the trading day. You're looking at slight gains here as as we kick off a shortened holiday week. The Dow up just above the flat line, up about 11 points. CSMB up about a tenth of a percent, holding above 4,500, a critical level here. The many on the street are watching, and the Nasdaq leading the charge, at least today, up just about three-tenths of a percent. Again, stocks coming off what was another solid week of gains. The Nasdaq closed the week last week up just over 2 percent, its best weekly performance that we've seen since June. So big question here whether or not this momentum continues as we do get a number of critical earnings results uh, over the next couple of days, specifically NVIDIA. They will be reporting after the bell tomorrow. Lots of focus just about the results that will get there and what that then tells us about the broader moves going forward. In terms of the sector action this morning, we're seeing some leadership here from energy leading the way, financials, industrials, consumer discretionary among the outperformers, real estate uh, and healthcare under a bit of pressure today. All right, stocks hovering around the flat line at the start of a sh holiday shortened week. The pause coming on the heels of three Three straight weeks of gains. Big tech has been leading the way with the Nasdaq recording its best week since June. So does this rally have legs? We want to bring in Drew Pettit. He's director of U.S. equity strategy at City. Drew, it's great to see you. So what do you think in terms of the momentum to the upside between now and year end? What does that look like? Yeah, look, we have a 4,600 target for the S&P for the end of the year. So we're getting close to our target. But admittedly, after a softer than expected CPI print, we actually think you have pretty good upside versus downside risk reward setup into the year end right now. Drew, you know, as we kind of near the Thanksgiving holiday, I, I continue to think about a lot of people that are going to go home. They're going to be sitting around the table, perhaps a few of them and uh, talking some of their investment strategy and some of the top takeaways from this year. Your top takeaway for the Thanksgiving Day table in terms of the equity market and, and strategy that investors can implore, what would that be? Uh, honestly, this has all been about a growth market this year. And if you want to talk about the past, yeah, talk about growth, talk about the Magnificent Seven, talk about AI, but if you're looking to the future, talk about earnings resilience. Admittedly, everyone's been talking about how bad the economy is or is about to be, but when we look at the fundamentals, we're actually really constructive looking ahead. So it, it's almost the boy who's cried wolf here when it's come to recession. We probably had the same talking point going into 2023 at this time last year. And then all of a sudden, we're looking at the S&P just came out of an earnings growth recession. And we actually think there's a lot more resilience ahead and probably a broadening of both market action and earnings growth under the surface. Drew, what is that earnings growth, do you think? What does that look like more specifically then for 2024? So admittedly, we're probably, not probably, we are a lot more bullish than a lot of our peers here. We expect you know, high single digit growth next year. And it's possible even if we have a recession. What a lot of people just don't realize is the stock market is not the U.S. economy. And then on top of that, there's other drivers. And we think the biggest under discussed story right now is, is productivity. Like we talk about AI from its effect on performance of the index this year. But think about as companies learn how to use this technology, both tech companies and non-tech companies, this is going to have an impact on efficiency in the bottom line, even if volume growth slows next year. Does that also have a knock-on impact on headcount for a lot of these companies? So, look, talk to a lot of companies right now, and they don't feel like they're aggressively overstaffed, and talk to their employees, they don't feel like they're underworked. So when it comes to staffing, you can do more with either the same amount of people or fewer people. It's a great way to manage cost pressures, especially on the labor side going forward. Like, look, you see this in industries that, are more basic like restaurants or basic consumer goods, retail and so on, how they can get more efficiency by managing inventories better, making their workers more productive. And then you're gonna see gains on the tech side and even in these more complicated multi-industrials where they can charge higher prices because there's a tech element built into a product or they can manage more complex supply chains a lot better than they have in the past. 
Drew, I know you said obviously the market's not the economy, but you did say something I do want to pick up on when it comes to the odds of a recession, because you said that you still see high single-digit growth here for earnings next year, even if we do see a recession. What's your base case for that slowdown? So our, our city economists expect quarter-over-quarter quarter GDP growth of about minus 2% in Q2 and Q3. So that's the house call. But where I like to tie this back to the stock market is that's not how we talk about earnings growth. We talk about earnings growth in year over year terms. So if you actually flip this around and look at real GDP on year over year terms, that's actually plus almost 1.5% in Q2 and barely negative in Q3. So a recession in economics terms, when you translate the math to how we speak about equities, actually isn't expected to be very deep. So our baseline again, our stated forecast is 245 for S&P 500 EPS in 2024. But even if we do have this mild recession, even if we get our economics base case, our economic team, if their base case uh, comes true, we still think you have mid single digits earnings growth. And I think a lot of our peers don't don't really give corporates that efficiency argument. They, they just aren't baking that in right now. All right, Drew Pettit, Director of U.S. Equity Strategy at Citi. Drew, thanks so much for taking the time. Well, Jeffrey's raising six flags from a, from a hold to a buy rating. The firm raising its price target to 32 bucks a share, saying that the merger with rival amusement park Cedar Fair is going to increase the value for stockholders of Six Flags. Jeffrey's also saying that while Six Flags has struggled with its operating model, Cedar Fair has been more consistent. Now, the merger of the two theme parks giants is expected to close during the first half of next year. We're looking at gains of just about four tenths of a percent when it comes to Six Flags. Lots of questions about what the combination is going to mean for this business going forward, if it's going to be enough in terms of cost synergies to really move the needle. Jeffrey's making the case that they do see that being the case. Of course, the question is, at least in the near term, how the how strong the economy is going forward into 2024, whether or not we see a material pullback from consumer spending, and then what that hit could look like, at least in the short term. Yeah, a, a few things here, and, and three primarily that come to mind. It's going to be cost energies in the form of making sure that you're having to spend less on marketing. This has been a highly promotional period for Six Flags, as even when we think back to the most recent report that we got from Six Flags, they talked about how much they had to ramp up some of that marketing effort in order to sell next season, next year's season passes and ultimately seeing more customers take on that season pass to know that they had a generated kind of guaranteed amount of revenue. That's one. Number two, investment in the guest experience. This is going to really rely on how they're looking across every single touch point, not just the rides, not just if you're going to Fright Fest or if you're hopping on Nitro. Uh, last time I did so was perhaps two decades ago. Perhaps. I can't do the math right now. But at the end of the day, the experience expansion and the acceleration of those events calendars, also something that they're investing into. But they're also going to have no control over one huge thing, and that's weather. They had to acknowledge this in the most recent quarter. Unusually difficult weather, still being able to grow the attendance. However, at the same time, it's really a question of how much in a consumer kind of discretionary spending pullback environment, even if you are still going to the parks, how much are you spending? while you're in the park. I don't know if I'm going to buy uh, three and four dipping Dots if I go back to a Six Flags, but I might get one for myself and perhaps one for my partner as well. Also, Deutsche Bank, we got to talk about the upgrade to Boeing here. From hold to buy and upping its price target from $205 to $270. The bank saying the aircraft deliveries are accelerating and that growth can be sustained. That means better earnings and free cash flow and a boost in shares. This comes after a tough year for the airplane manufacturer. Over the summer, an issue stalled at 737 deliveries. However, in recent weeks, we do know that this company actually just had a really great Dubai air show uh, with orders coming in from some international partners here. And I think that showed the strength in some of their large plane orders um, and what the, the backlog for that is going to look like even years on out from this point. Yeah, I'm putting some numbers on that. They see deliveries in 2024 being 700, 2025, 800, 2026, 820. So the rationale 
behind this upgrade. They caught it pretty simple. It's obviously all just around the deliveries, the numbers there, and the acceleration that at least Deutsche Bank sees for Boeing deliveries in the coming years. You mentioned it there, Brad. It has been a tumultuous uh, several years here for yeah. Boeing, specifically even the last couple of months, just in terms of some of the setbacks, some of the uh, product issues that Boeing has had to deal with and the effect, the impact that that has had then on deliveries, at least for this year. But going back and looking ahead, or going forward, excuse me, I should say, and looking ahead to 2024, but beyond that over the next several years, at least Deutsche Bank sees things shaping up. And pretty quickly, when you talk about the fact that they do see Excel uh, deliveries getting to 800 by 2025, so just about a year and a half from now, two years from now. All right, well, we got all your market action ahead live from New York City here at Yahoo Finance headquarters. We'll be right back. It's a big week for NVIDIA as the AI-focused company gets set to report third quarter results after the bell tomorrow. Shares of the chip maker are up nearly 240 percent since the start of the year. Its blockbuster earnings report back in May also added to some of the upward um, momentum that we're seeing play out in the stock. While our next guest, though, isn't expecting a slowdown anytime soon, calling NVIDIA best positioned at this point. We want to bring in Ruben Roy. He's Stiefel, Applied Technology Analyst here for more. And Ruben, when you talk about the fact that NVIDIA is best positioned, what do you see that upside potential looking like then as we look ahead to 2024? Well, uh, the rest of the, uh, and thanks for having me. Uh, the rest of 24, we're looking for a, bit, a beaten raise again. So we saw that in May, as you pointed out, and then again uh, with the July quarter when NVIDIA reported in August. And we haven't seen any slowdown to you know, sort of the momentum that NVIDIA is seeing on orders for their high-end chips called the H100 for large language model training networks. And um, and we expect that to continue into year end and into next year. There's been some supply constraints that have impacted, in our view, some of the sales that NVIDIA could have had this year. And we, we expect those supply constraints to start to ease as we get into the end of the year. And so you put all that together and we think we have several quarters ahead uh, at a minimum where we have quite robust results coming up. And so additionally here, when you think about some of that AI demand, where, where do you expect it to roll in from, even more so internationally, given some of the curves that have been put in place? NVIDIA, other chip makers have had to make sure that they navigate around successfully. Yeah, thanks, Brad. That's going to be a focus point, of course, on the call. So increased export restrictions and you know coming down to even some of the chips that some analysts and investors did not expect. Uh, the U.S. government to put restrictions on. You know, since then, there's been some chatter that NVIDIA has come up with a number of SKUs that are, again, underneath the 
specifications that the government is worried about. We'll see how that plays out. You know, at, at a certain point, I think there's a spirit of the law, you know, type of um, case to be made for, hey, you know, we shouldn't be shipping some types of technology to some countries. So we'll see how NVIDIA, um, you know, comments on those questions. I would say, though, in terms of demand, the company, you know, did file uh, post the restriction announcement and uh, so that they're, they're not expecting any near term impacts to their financials. And, you know, our checks out in the channel would suggest that that is the case. We think, as I said, that there's quite a bit of demand globally, ex-China. Uh, so certainly in the U.S., the big cloud service providers, uh, you, you folks were talking about Microsoft, and we think that's going to continue to be a very big opportunity for NVIDIA going forward. Uh, but even, you know, outside of the U.S. in areas like Europe, Japan, South Korea, you name it. And, you know, there's a lot going on with AI. And it, like uh, you said as well, uh, NVIDIA remains, in our view, the, the, the best way to uh, you know, kind of position for that uh, growth. Ruben, you mentioned Microsoft there, and more specifically what we've seen play out over the last 72 hours now that Sam Altman is on board here with Microsoft. There were reports, of course, that he was looking to raise funding here for a new chip venture that would rival NVIDIA. How do you see that competition then stacking up with Altman now at Microsoft, between Microsoft and NVIDIA? Yeah, you know, Microsoft last week at Ignite actually announced two of their own uh, semiconductor uh, devices that they've been working on for quite a while. And, you know, I think we're going to see a lot of that, uh, you know, going forward. No one wants to be beholden to one vendor. Uh, and, and so over the next, you know, several years, I think you will see increasing competition. AMD, in our view, is the you know, second best to NVIDIA from a hardware perspective, having uh, their MI series of GPUs launching uh, at the end of this year and into next year. And if you look at that company, they're looking for around $2 billion in uh, MI300 related sales next year. That's a pretty small percentage of overall AI GPU revenue. We're estimating you know, somewhere around $60 billion for data center revenues for NVIDIA next year. So yes, I think there will be competition and Sam Altman um, you know, potentially you know, going to Microsoft and you know, leading the charge you know, to try to come up with some lower cost chips or what have you, I, I think, you know, we'll see that happen. Uh, but uh, I'm not expecting that to be meaningfully, you know, negative in terms of competition anytime soon. I would also point out that Google is on their fifth generation TPU, which is an AI uh, specific uh, you know, chip that they've been working on. And, you know, even there, Google is a very big customer of, uh, of NVIDIA. So I think that, you know, this is a very big market and NVIDIA is, again, the best technology for the market at this point. Is there an acquisition target out there for NVIDIA that is perhaps synonymous with an open AI, even if they, NVIDIA does have their own partnerships to advance their generative AI ambitions here in the future? Yeah, it's a great question, Brad. So I think, you know, uh, one of the other announcements that came out of Ignite that we thought was very interesting was the so-called AI foundry that uh, NVIDIA is doing with Microsoft, and that's software, and that's embedding software layers, NVIDIA's model for AI, you know, kind of their operating system, which is called CUDA, and, um, you know, kind of in, entrenching themselves into the AI offerings that are coming, not just from Microsoft, but enterprise customers, right? So now we're starting to see the broadening and, you know, some ROI potential for customers. SAP was, uh, was named MDOX and others. And so I think, you know, from a software perspective, you know, that's the next area potentially for NVIDIA to expand into. Um, they've got a cloud DD, DGX offering where they're you know, selling capacity of GPU capacity. And, you know, moving forward, they can, in our view, start to really ramp up revenue if they're able to, you know, get into, you know, further into the software ecosystem. So that's where I would be looking for M&A and, you know, certainly would make sense from a longer term perspective. Ruben, always a pleasure to get some of your insights here. And thanks for uh, kicking off the trading week here with us. Ruben Roy, Stiefel, Applied Technology Analyst. Uh, you've got a busy week ahead and then uh, holiday as well. So uh, <laughs> all the Happy best. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanks. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanks. All Thank your markets you. action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
There is this vision on the street over the state of corporate earnings. J.P. Morgan Chase strategist Mislav Matejcik is saying uh, that strikes could be a more bearish tone, saying that shrinking pricing power will eat into overall revenue and margins, regardless of whether growth contracts. He wrote in a note to clients, profit growth in 2024 could, quote, end up more flattish rather than up and this is without having recession as a base case. So if we have an outright contraction, then corporate profits are likely to fall, end quote. Citigroup's Scott Croner, on the other hand, says that he expects profits to hold up, even if the economy slips into a recession. Croner wrote in his recent note that he sees a more consistent growth outlook for sectors. Cronert is more bullish overall, recently boosting his year-end S&P 500 target to 4,600, which is where the index is actually approaching right now as we've continued to watch this, this market come back over the last few weeks here for the S&P 500. Yeah, and of course, when we take a look at some of these calls out here, not exactly surprising when we know J.P. Morgan's uh, Matushka here has been bearish despite the rally that we have seen in stocks really since the start of the year, but especially what we've seen play out over recent weeks. So these outlooks coming as we do near the end of the third quarter earnings season. Taking a look at the results, S&P profits rising 4% in the third quarter. I was compared with the most recent projections of just about a 1% decline, 1.2% decline. So clearly an outperformance here as we look at the third quarter, what that means for the current quarter numbers and what that means for 2024 is right now is what is being debated. In terms of what Citi sees, they see profits holding up even if the economy slips into a recession. And we were just speaking uh, with a member of the city's team earlier in the show, Drew Pettit, and he was laying out exactly why they see or what they see driving corporate profits ahead in 2024 and taking a look at some of those numbers. He was making the case, and like you just said, it's with the leader of this note here, that they still see that being the case, even though we could potentially see a recession. So even if we do see contraction, mm. they do see corporate profits uh, holding on. And like the point that he made, the markets, it's not the economy. And so exactly, you got to draw the distinction between the two, and he still sees reasons. Uh, to be bullish, at least at this point, when you look ahead to corporate profits. All right, getting back to the big story of the day, hundreds of open AI employees are reportedly threatening to quit unless the board resigns. This follows the ouster of CEO Sam Altman now in a letter obtained by journalist Kara Swisher. More than 500 of open AI's 700 employees accused the company's board of jeopardizing their work and undermining their mission. They also reject the idea that open AI was moving too quickly and without concern for safety, they, write, they wrote, quote, our work on AI safety and governance shapes global norms. Most of the staff are threatening to leave the company, saying that Microsoft has assured them that there are positions for them all at the tech giant's advanced AI research team. What exactly that look like? that looks like right now uh, remains to be seen, but certainly has been uh, a chaotic or whirlwind of the last 72 hours. In fact, the Sam Altman was ousted from open AI on Friday, what exactly played out over the weekend. And here we are Monday morning with the news that he is going to be a member of Microsoft's team right there, leading the new AI team, the AI strategy within Microsoft. If we do see more members, a sizable number, and especially a key employee is there at OpenAI, leave the firm and go to Microsoft. Of course, lots of questions just about what the future of OpenAI looks like and whether or not this is a company that can hold on if they do lose those key employees. Yeah, you got a note out from Oppenheimer this morning as well saying that their understanding is that Altman had a critical role in making all of the language learning models work well and expect other employees to flock to him. The dispute here, now this is where they note the dispute came in with chief scientist Ilya Suskever, uh, who is the dis uh, disciple, they say, of Jeffrey Hinton, um, AGI true believers there. We won't go down that rabbit hole, but explaining the desire to advance the technology carefully given potential existential risks. Now, whether you listen to Elon Musk or some of the other kind of notable figures who have talked about as existential risk as uh, existential risk with regard to generative AI Altman and Nadella, they still share those concerns, uh, Oppenheimer notes, but have different approaches to all of this. So the larger question here, how many of those employees get what they're looking for in a changed over type of leadership structure at the board level, which cascades down to perhaps whether or not they're able to retain the uh, full headcount that they do have at this point in time. Um, that still remains unclear. And whether or not Altman immediately begins poaching some of that talent to bring them over to Microsoft did well and what perhaps blank check he's given by Microsoft to do so as well here.
Yeah, something we will uh, obviously closely uh, follow here throughout the day and throughout the week. All right, keep it right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead. We'll be right back. The future of sustainable boating is rapidly approaching. Electrification is taking center stage. But e-fuels and hydrogen technology are also looking for a piece of the pie as the boating industry goes green. Electrification and sustainability are finally upending the auto industry and changing the way we move. A group of companies focused on the $19 billion boating market see their industry as next. From small outboard power boats to massive land yachts of the sea, the global boating industry is expected to swell in the coming years thanks to government subsidies and more interests, not just in leisure, but in all aspects of marine travel. From big players like Brunswick to smaller firms like Candela, the marine industry is going high tech. These companies are betting on the electric blue wave, which experts say will grow by $4.4 billion more than doubling sales by 2030. Imagine small to medium-sized boats packing high-power batteries and motors that create quiet, near-instantaneous power with zero emissions. Then there's e-fuels, synthesized fuels that are sustainably produced and carbon neutral when used. E-fuels can power anything from your neighbor's Boston whaler to an Exxon tanker ship. And another emergent technology entering the boating market, hydrogen power. It's clean, powerful, and offers range fit for consumer and commercial applications. All right, so let's break down where things stand right now. We want to bring in James Hardiman. He's City Leisure and Travel Analyst. We also have Jeff Wassel. He's Director of Environment, Health, and Safety Compliance for the National Marine Manufacturers Association. Great to see both of you. Jeff, let me start with you. We just heard Praz uh, laying out the growth prospects, what exactly we could see the growth look like in the electric boat industry between now and 2030. In terms of where we are in this transition, what does that look like? Yeah, so I mean, it's a really exciting time in the uh, recreational boating industry right now, and uh, there's a lot, a uh, lot going on with uh, technology. We've seen uh, uh, a really huge improvement uh, across all of the boating segments, and we're we've just uh, completed a uh, really interesting report 
uh, talking about decarbonization. And I think probably one of the issues that we face uh, as an industry is perception that recreational boating contributes unnecessarily to global climate change and pollution and the rest. As it stands, we account for about 0.7% of transportation CO2 in the United States, and we account for about 0.4% of transportation CO2 in Europe. So small numbers, but nonetheless, everyone needs to do their part to reduce uh, emissions. And we just uh, reached out to, we just completed a, a nearly a two-year project working with uh, ICOMIA, which is the International Council of Marine Industry Associations and Ricardo uh, PLC, which is a very uh, well-respected uh, global uh, engineering firm. And we wanted to look at what's the best way for our industry to decarbonize moving forward. And what we found is it's really a portfolio of technologies. You mentioned a little bit about uh, sustainable marine fuels, electrification, foiling, advanced uh, hull design. Some of these tech, you know, all of these technologies are gonna be required to really minimize CO2 from recreational boating because it is such a, a very different uh, uh, scenario than what you see happening in the automotive industry. So Jeff, just to kind of follow up on that report you guys put out, looking at beyond recreational, I know you don't necessarily do work with the commercial side, but do you think stuff like hydrogen or e-fuels is good for, let's say tanker ships and big industrial mass power, uh, boats that are on the water for extended periods of time? Yeah, absolutely, I do. And because of the energy density issue, um, boats require a lot of energy to move through the water. It's a factor of, of roughly 10 compared to a car. Um, so to pack that kind of energy density uh, into batteries can be difficult uh, for a lot of the vessels. And like I said, it's not, certainly electrification plays its role, but sustainable marine fuels plays a big role for two reasons. Number one, we talk about the, there's about 12 million registered power boats in the United States today uh, that are going to rely on liquid fuels for quite some time. And the second thing you talk about is on the commercial side, going across oceans with, uh, with large uh, cargo that requires an enormous amount of energy. So uh, those are really two reasons why we'll see liquid fuels and, and specifically sustainable marine fuels play a huge role in our industry moving forward as well. James, let's talk about what this means for investors, for those out there who are very interested in maybe betting on this, this move here as we talk about the transition for electric boats. What companies should investors keep in mind that are, that are leading the charge? Sure. So, um, you know, one of the biggest, if not the biggest boat manufacturer in the world, uh, Brunswick Corporation, uh, from, the, from, the, from the names that we look at, is certainly at the forefront of uh, electrification. Um, and, you know, I think it's still in its very early at this point. And, and I think all of the marine companies, the marine stocks are, are really sort of struggling to get through this, this macro, whatever this is, uh, headwind downturn. Um, but I think as we look forward, uh, further into the future, as we sit here today, there are a number of sort of low voltage power, uh, propulsion options. Um, those are typically going to be for smaller boats. I think as we if we look out to the future, there's an opportunity to get electrification into some much larger engines, right? The, 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 the whole concern about battery energy density uh, is certainly an issue today. And so a lot of the, the propulsion electrification, right? Electric uh, outboard engines are just extremely expensive. Um, we've seen some cool sort of concept vehicles uh, along those lines, but from a consumer perspective, way too expensive today, but the hope is that over the next five to 10 years, um, they'll take up a bit, much bigger chunk of, of the market. Hey James, with the sort of the, the the reach of a bunch of different types of public boating companies, is Brunswick is it, is, is it their size that kind of gives them the advantage? Is it their strat strategy with autonomous and things like that that you like there for them? For sure, the size helps them. I mean, they 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 have a regular business between their boats, um, their engine business, and then their parts and accessories, which are sort of the cash cows, right? And that allows them to invest in. Um, future technologies and ultimately future proofing their business. Uh, and so that's where you're going to see a lot of these investments made in, in new technologies uh, and certainly this, this electrification strategy. 
Uh, hey, Jeff, a uh, quick follow here about the sort of the, you know, you, you represent a number of manufacturers uh, in the space, especially in the United States. What are they saying, like manufacturers like Brunswick, but what are they saying about going green? Do they really want to go? Are they reluctant to? Or do they see an opportunity there to sort of uh, have people kind of convert their boats over to cleaner power? Uh, no, I, I mean, certainly everyone in the industry is really excited about, uh, you know, the technologies that we have moving forward. I wanted to come back to a point that you had made earlier about electric propulsion. It's not only the propulsion system that we're talking about. It's, you know, you're starting to see uh, lithium ion battery banks be used uh, in boats to power what's called the hotel load. So these are your safety systems, your bilge pumps um, and uh, lights and things like that. Uh, and you're reducing the reliance on a generator as well. So it's not just the propulsion. One point I wanna make out that's really important as well is that when you look at what's happening in the automotive industry as it moves more and more toward electrification, a lot of folks think it's exactly the same situation in recreational marine. Here's the difference. What are the majority of cars doing right now across the United States in major cities? They're sitting in traffic, they're being used, okay? If you look at and ask the same question, what are the majority of recreational boats doing right now? Uh, they're sitting on standby. You know, they're sitting at marinas. They're, I'm, I'm in Chicago. It snowed last week, so my boat's going to be covered up for the next seven months. So, you know, there's a very big difference when you do a life cycle analysis looking at, you know, what's the best way of minimizing CO2 emissions. You have to take that into account. You have to understand that the usage of the boat is probably one of the smaller uh, impacts in terms of CO2. It's really on the production side. So we, our industry is employing a lot of folks as chief sustainability officers, chief, uh, managers to manage sustainability of the boat itself during production, manufacturing, distribution. And that's where you're seeing a lot of the work too. I know a lot of folks just talk about the propulsion system, but there's a ton of work that's going on uh, in the production of these uh, vessels that should be uh, talked about as well when we talk about minimizing CO2 emissions. So James, in looking at what 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 um, what we just heard just now about the sort of the the sort of varied interests in terms of propulsion, what do you want to hear from companies when they talk about their conversion? Is it are they are they do are they too slow? Or are they doing it just right? Is it maybe they should take pump the brakes and sort of stick with traditional powertrains just to keep you know the money flowing through into the into the coffers? You know, I think they need to do both, right? They they need to to navigate their way through the current downturn. I think they need to meet consumers where they are, um, but ultimately pr uh, prepare for a future in which this battery technology is not only able to, to create higher horsepower applications that are uh, lighter and don't Im impact the performance of the boat in a, in a negative way, but also cheaper. Um, and like so many other applications that we've seen, um, if you are if you are engineering for today, you might never make that investment. Um, but if you you know can appreciate that that um, so much of this technology is improving at, at such a fast rate, particularly the battery technology, you will be there um, when when there are some um, fitting applications from a consumer perspective. And that's only uh, as I see it a matter of time. But yeah, I, I think investors. If, if companies uh, focused solely on some of these new technologies today, they would probably be losing money, suffice it to say. Um, but certainly, I, I think there's a place in the investment portfolio, you know, to, to prepare for that future. And maybe it's big boats or maybe it's wave runners. We'll see electrification is coming soon. So thanks, James Hardiman, City Leisure and Travel Analyst, and Jeff Wassel, Director of Environment, Health and Safety Compliance for the National Marine Manufacturers Association. Thanks again, guys. Really appreciate it. Um, Thank you. To illustrate Brunswick's stamp on the industry, more than 50% of outboard motors sold in the U.S. are made by their brand, Mercury Marine, huge company there. The company is out diving into electric outboard market for the first time, which may help push the growing sector closer to the mainstream. I met up with Mercury's electrification technical manager, Andy Prisbel in Oshkosh, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, sorry, to get a firsthand look at their Avatar line. Check it out. So Andy, looking at this outboard motor, what exactly are the main components or the main features that people will be looking at and how does it all work? 
at first glance, it looks like a standard outboard. This is a little bit different electrification. We've put a lot of time and effort into designing super efficient props, which means battery range for people. And so when we're talking about range, what are we talking about here? Full power, half power, Avatar outboards are rated for one hour at the rated power. As soon as you come off of that, the it's an exponential curve. So if you're at 75% throttle, it's three hours. If you're at 50% throttle, it's you know close to four to six hours. How easy is it to take this thing off a boat and on a boat? Portability is a big deal in this market segment. You just, there's a latch, you can take the outboard off, tip the tiller handle down, and off you go. What is the setup they're in right here? This is a, our Mercury 7.5E, and it's on our Lund WC12, small aluminum fishing boat. This outboard is a very versatile outboard. It can be put on multiple different vessels. There's just no sound at all. I'm just drawn by how, how calm it is, how quiet it is and sort of like the ease of use, I guess, right? This will really open up the doors to a new generation, a new type of people that want to experience the water. Let me give it a try. Absolutely. All right. That's backwards. All right, here we go. How was it? What do you think? Give us your review. Uh, you know, I was I was surprised at how smooth it is and yeah. easy to use. Although I did I did go in reverse on accident because you got you got to twist the little knob. I wasn't going to point that out. I noticed. It. <laughs> <laughs> but I it's quiet, smooth, good power. It was it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. Yeah, I think the big question for a lot of boaters out there, at least when you talk about the consumer, the individual level, is the power yeah. behind that and yeah. exactly what that is going to be able to produce. But I love the quiet nature of it. Yeah. I think that's going to be a game changer I think for well. ponds and small lakes, it's mm -hmm. like perfect. But you're absolutely, if you want that high power, that's going to be a ways away. It is. All right, Pras, great stuff. Thanks so much. Thanks. Keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead. We'll be right back.
Argentina has elected a new president. The libertarian Javier Milei won a second round runoff vote on Sunday with about 56% of the vote. Now he has the task of turning the country's economy around amid 143% inflation, foreign, foreign currency reserves, excuse me, in the red, and a looming recession. One of his pledges to fix the situation is ditching the peso, shutting down the central bank, and committing to dollarization. Argentina's peso has been hit with a crisis and recession that has sunk its value and left it with a wide array of exchange rates. Millet and his advisors see turning to the U.S. dollar as a way to stabilize the economy and the country. Meanwhile, the U.S. dollar is extending losses, the greenback sliding to a more than two-month low as traders believe that monetary tightening is over and are now focused on the Fed cutting rates. As the dollar falls, some investors will be looking for opportunities in emerging markets. So here with the details on some e trends is our very own Jared Blickery. Hey, Jared. Hey, Brad. Uh, you nailed it. It's all about what the Fed is doing. In my last hit an hour ago, I was talking about interest rate differentials. When you have a really strong currency like the United States and you have higher interest rates than just about the entire world, people are going to rush into your currency and that's going to push the value of the dollar up and others down. But at this stage in the business cycle, markets are forward looking. They're looking to the, the Fed increasingly being say, uh, seen as being on hold. So if the Fed isn't going to raise rates anymore, uh, no need to scramble into the US dollar. Therefore, this is the time of the business cycle when emerging markets can potentially flourish. Uh, but first, before I get into uh, some of the indices around the world, I want to focus on currencies first. Um, this is the U.S. dollar versus a bunch of pairs around the world. And we're t just talking about Argentina. Well, the U.S. dollar is up 100.1 percent versus the Argentine peso. Just think about that. That is an incredible rate. That means the value of their currency is just about halved in this very short time period. That's not even one year. If you take a look over the last five years, 884 um, percent, that is not something that bodes well for anybody who is borrowing in U.S. dollars down there. Uh, but back to the main point, the U.S. dollar has been strong for the year, but it has fallen off in the last few days. Um, let's take a look at a one-month view, and you can see there is a lot more red here than there is green. That means that the dollar weakening is now a tailwind for stocks. Now, let's get to uh, some of the uh, sector, not sectors, some of the index action here. Uh, just one more screen. And there we go. We're going to see if I can pull this up. Oh, it doesn't want to cooperate. We'll have to see. There we go. Sorry about that, guys. Here we go. We have the indexes that I was looking for. Um, year to date, we see uh, over actually uh, one month today, we see the Bovespa, that's Brazil, that has benefited the most from the dollar uh, weakening over the last month. Then we have the NASDAQ, that's been up another 9% after flagging for a few months. We got Spain, we got Germany, all of those outperforming the S&P 500. So this really has been a time potentially for that shining. And just on a year to date basis, you can really see the outperform performance still of the U.S. NASDAQ composite up 35 percent, Nikkei up 28 percent. Pretty large differential there from a lot of these other indices. For instance, the Hang Seng, which is down 10 percent. China, sometimes considered still an emerging market. That's debatable, but it has definitely had some of the worst problems this year. All right, Jared, thanks so much for the deep dive here in terms of what we're seeing play out from around the world. Well, the UN's climate conference, COP28, marking the world's 28th gathering of leaders trying to confront climate change since the first conference of the parties in 1995. While well, as climate activism has exploded around the world, so has corporate investment in clean energy technology and business practices. But investors may no longer be buying into the hype. $14 billion has been pulled from ESG funds this year as returns have not met expectations. So how much can we expect investors to be watching the information coming out of COP28 next week? We want to bring in David Calloway, Calloway Climate Insights founder. And David, when you take a look maybe at the fact that investors haven't been as excited about ESG funds, we have seen a bit of resurgence or excitement around clean energy stocks and some of the movement that we've seen over the last couple of weeks. How do you think investors are looking ahead to COP28 and potential investment opportunities within the climate change discussion. You know, Shauna, it's interesting. People, it's not that people don't want to invest in yeah. climate change and clean energy tech stocks. It's that all these stocks are highly interest rate sensitive. 
and we've been in a rising rate environment for more than a year and a half. Now that's starting to turn, as Brad said earlier. People are starting to see, looking out for the next rate cut, which will probably be near the end of next year. Um, that's good news for these stocks. That's why we've started to see them bounce. And it was interesting, there was a front page story in the Wall Street Journal that they essentially writing the obit of ESG stocks. And I saw that and I said, that's the capitulation. That's what means now, now everyone could get back into them. Um, COP is going to be very important for this. And one of the things that is important for COP was the agreement last week uh, between President Biden and Xi Jinping in San Francisco to triple the renewable energy capacity in their countries. China's a leader in renewable energy. Biden has been working hard, as you know here. That agreement is very important because it sets the stage for more international co cooperation at COP. And one of the things they're going to be talking about at COP is how to phase out or phase down oil usage. To do that, you have to have investment in renewable energy. So this agreement really kind of sets the table uh, for a potentially um, uh, successful COP, one that we, you know, we haven't really had one since, uh, since 2015. And that's good for renewable energy stocks and for renewable energy investors. What is, I guess, in order for COP to be successful, what would that entail from your opinion? So what we saw in 2015 was the Paris Accord, right? It was, mm -hmm. COP was in Paris. All the countries of the world signed on to an agreement to keep global and war, uh, prices from global temperatures from rising too far, right? That was the last time they agreed on anything. Mm -hmm. And every year we all go to COP, something like 70,000 people go in this year to Dubai. Uh, and everyone's looking for a global agreement and every year it collapses or it's kind of warm toast or something like that. This at least sets the stage that we might see something interesting, either in the uh, uh, agreement to phase down oil, which is good for renewable energy investors, or the uh, payment of loss and damages to poorer countries, which is another thing. Um, you know, I, for one, am kind of skeptical that you can get 100 governments in a room to agree on anything. But if you have the two biggest polluters in the world, U.S. and China, agreeing on something, there's, there's room for some optimism. I mean, when we've spoken with climatologists and even some of the climate economists out there, what they've continued to remind us is that we're coming off of, or we're still in the midst of, but perhaps going to be rounding out one of the hottest years on record during 2023. How does that change the, the dialogue, the discourse from some of the global world leaders? Well, you know, the problem is the global world leaders are, you know, either running for election or, you know, or, or you know, authoritarians with, uh, with their own uh, schedules. They're not on the climate change schedule. The world is continuing to get hotter. It was the hottest September we ever had. Probably we're going to look back on that as the coolest one we've had 20 years from now, right? Because uh, they're going to continue to get hotter. So the pressure, it's like a frog in a, in a boiling water, right? The pressure continues to rise on these global leaders. And then they have alternative pressures, such as facing re-elections and the higher costs of climate change. So they're not on the same schedule. They need to be essentially shocked into that. And I think, Brad, that you know what we saw this year in climate disasters um, something like $89 billion climate disasters the last few years is going to start to put that pressure on. And when you take a look at what's happened just over the last, what, four or six weeks when it comes to the strategic investments that we've seen from Exxon and Chevron essentially doubling down on fossil fuels, but when you take into account this transition that we're hopefully are going to see to clean energy, how do you address, I guess, the disconnect that we're seeing play out between the developed and the underdeveloped world and these larger players that are trying to obviously position them, their businesses best to address the undeveloped world, but then also position for the developed world's transition, hopefully eventually here, to clean energy. Yeah, a lot of what they're going to be talking about in Dubai is loss and damages, which is will America pay hundreds of billions of dollars to protect, you know, Madagascar and stuff like that. Probably not going to happen, right? The oil companies, I'm a big proponent of the fact that they're going to help us with solutions. And there, there, a lot of talk is going to be uh, about carbon capture and storage, which is one of the hottest uh, subjects on Wall Street, has been for the last year. The idea that you can pull carbon from the air and it's at the same time continue to produce 
oil. So they're going to be pushing that. They're doubling down on squeezing the last drops of oil out of the earth, unfortunately. But if they can push that technology, and they're the ones that have that technology, not the startups that we talk about or write about. They're the ones that have it. If they can push that and come to some agreements with the governments. Um, you know, we could see a radical new um, era of, of, of creating more energy for people, renewable plus fossil fuels, and making the world a cleaner place. All right. A lot to keep tabs on over the next week here and even more so beyond. David Calloway, who is the Calloway Climate Insights founder, joining us here on set. Thanks so much. Thank you both. Appreciate it. We've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Well, a fun day for Six Flags. The stock is ticking slightly higher this morning after Jefferies lifted its rating on the amusement park operator to buy from hold. Jefferies also upping its price target by $7, now sitting at $32 a share. The investment firm believes that the merger of Six Flags and Cedar Fair will, quote, materially increase value for shareholders. Let's bring in the analyst behind that call, David Katz, Jefferies Managing Director and Equity Research Analyst. You know, I got to imagine this is a pretty fun job that you have here. You get to go on some of these theme park rides, the attractions, really get a good view of the scape here and tell consumers and investors whether or not the investments that companies like Six Flags are making is actually paying off. Is it paying off? And what should investors expect over the long term after some of these investments, after some of the marketing and this tie up with Cedar? Yeah, fortunately, I don't have to go on any of the rides. <laughs> Uh, uh, in order to reach our investment conclusions, which we have in our note this morning. Um, but, but what I would say is having followed Six Flags as a company, as an enterprise for many years, uh, it has lacked a consistency of strate strategy and management. Uh, it, uh, it, it really has uh, been challenged to define its, its value proposition to consumers. Uh, and, I, and I think that's been going on for a decade or more. Uh, and what the fun tie-up brings it uh, is a stable operating model that Cedar Fair has, uh, a, an experienced management team across the board, uh, which Six has has you know not had. And I say experienced with respect to the theme park business, uh, which is not necessarily a growth business. And so the essence of our call this morning is uh, that by putting the businesses together uh, and defining a clear value proposition. Uh, providing a, a stable set of capital allocation uh, frameworks, uh, 
around the business. Uh, it can go back to trading at that double digit multiple level while returning capital, while funding the business properly, instead of the seven and a half times at which it closed on Friday. And, and we're talking about cash flow and EBITDA. And, and that's the essence of our call this morning. David, when you talk about that upside, I guess more specifically, what does that look like? And especially given the macroeconomic environment right now, how much risk do you see maybe associated with some of these names in the near term? Yeah, and, and it's a great question. And, and we have gravitated toward names in our coverage. If you look all across our gaming, lodging, and leisure coverage at Jefferies, what you see are uh, companies that are exposed to the macroeconomy in ways. This is more of a fixer upper where we need to establish a model uh, an execution plan, uh, a setting of expectations and meeting expectations. Those are all issues that do not warrant, do not require the macro economy uh, to do anything spectacular. In fact, it can be successful within a relatively wide range of outcomes. But for sure, across all of our coverage, we're focused on the macro economy and its impacts on the business. But we like this one because it doesn't need the economy to work. What type of pricing power does this company have when it comes to the season passes, especially in an environment where consumers are being extremely judicious about some of their experiential spending? Right. It's, a, it's also a good question. And, it, and in our case, we are not calling for them uh, a requirement to drive price in order to be successful with this integration. What they need to do, you know, much more importantly, is just get a clearer picture of who the patrons are that are coming into the parks, what it is that's motivating them to spend, uh, and being much more efficient about it. Um, you know, this is a company that hasn't really had a sophisticated data plan uh, in place. Uh, in terms of tracking its customers on providing a sophisticated experience the way we see many of our other uh, consumer facing companies execute. And that's what they have to do, not necessarily get another buck or two uh, at a price. David, when it comes to this turnaround, the potential that you see, this upside potential that you do see within the stock, especially uh, considering what it will look like after the merger goes through, I guess when we talk about the timetable of that turnaround, how quickly do you see this taking shape? Yeah, I, I expect that there will be, uh, you know, we always look at these things over a spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. There's going to be some low hanging fruit, right? And a lot of that is going to be cost synergy, uh, where, you know, SG&A provides and the, and the operating base of Six Flags provides an opportunity to, to cut costs. It's interesting when you look at the map. Uh, of these two companies, there's only a modest amount of overlap. And I think that's an important thing, except for California and Texas, where there are some redundant exposures. Uh, and so, you know, th that we think will provide some scale benefits and some cost benefits. Uh, and I think you'll start to see those within a very short amount of time. Later on are really the revenue synergies where they can start to push things uh, uh, like the membership program and the pass program, like their sponsorship uh, revenues, which you know come as a second derivative of the data gathering and, and of the stable operating model. I think those revenue synergies come a bit later on. And then lastly here, that experience in the park. What revolutionary do you need to see inside of these park experiences to make sure that they not only hit your expectations, but perhaps exceed them in the future? Yeah, look, I think I think execution and efficiency is the most important thing. Uh, the current six management team has done a very nice job of improving uh, some of the elements of that experience with food, uh, shortening lines. But I think there's a lot more that can be done to create an efficient experience for a family uh, or a group of people to come in, do what they want to do, enjoy it. Uh, you know, get their car parked, get back in their car, uh, and and call it a good day. And I, so I do think this is really an execution story more than anything else. All right, Six Flags shares up just about a half of a percent right now in early trading. David Katz, always great to talk to you. Jeffrey is Managing Director, thanks. Keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead. We'll be right back. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now?
I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancel. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Investor Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas, and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there is more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now you gotta scope that out and the numbers really tell the story what does all this mean for you keep it tuned into yahoo finance The global e-commerce market is expected to surpass $6 trillion this year. That's according to insider intelligence. And as the broader economic challenges mount, like falling discretionary demand and also higher operating costs, some retailers are cutting back on free returns. About 41% of retailers are charging return fees this year. That's up from just over 30% a year ago. This is all according to a report from retail tech company Narvar. We want to bring in Amit Sharma. He is Narvar's founder and CEO. Amit, it's good to see you here. So we certainly are starting to see this trend. More and more retailers are charging 
for returns. How do you see this? Do you at all see this impacting consumer spending decisions this holiday season? No, returns uh, are a key part of online retailers and it definitely is impacting their cost and margins. So from a consumer perspective, you know, they will see these uh, costs are actually coming down and they have to pay a little bit more to return now, especially, you know, as, um, you know, see gas prices continue to be high as well as the um, labor cost also plays an uh, impact in, in the returns cost as well. And when you think about the overall consumer environment, what you're seeing right now in just the amount of consumers that are looking for the ability to not just track their packages, but are continuing to spend, because this is something that you guys would have insight to, you know, where are we comped to some of the periods where consumers were spending a lot because they had more discretionary income or at least had more of that cash pile that they were sitting on? Uh, and then ultimately, you know, how do we look going into this holiday season from orders that you're also able to see some insight into? Yeah, overall, what we see is that there is um, a, that cautious uh, nature that we see in the consumer side of it. Um, they are actually buying, but the average basket size is lower compared to year over year. And, um, you know, we are also seeing returns. We talked about it uh, where consumers are actually um, shopping. Sometimes price may change and they actually will return the item in order to get um, a lower price or even discounted item. So we, we are seeing um, retailers are seeing the impact both on the basket size and, and returns rate as well. In terms of some of the data that you're looking at, just some of the trends that you're noticing ahead of the holiday season, how does that compare to what we've seen in years past? So um, in a specific, specifically in terms of uh, overall um, shopping, we'll see you know, much more cautious consumers. So we don't see a significant uh, year over year increase in the online shopping for sure. Second is around returns. As you mentioned in your uh, opening comments that returns rates are increasing. So we're gonna see the same um, trend into these holidays. We're gonna see higher returns rate compared to years past. Correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that you work with both companies like Nike, companies like Rent the Runway, where you would be able to see kind of both sides of the equation, where somebody is having something shipped to them, but also where something is being shipped back uh, in order to kind of return that high-end luxury good that somebody might have just been taking on for an event that they were wearing. All that aside, have you seen a dramatic shift in the number of consumers that are kind of buying into some of the, you know, kind of pick, pack, ship, and then send back type of services like Stitch Fix, like Rent the Runway, that had done really well uh, in making sure that that was curated for them? So there are two parts of it. Yes, we work with over 1,500 global brands and retailers, not only in the U.S., but worldwide, both in terms of order being shipped, tracked, and notified, as well as returns and exchanges. So in terms of, um, you know, where services being ordered with a run the runway and stitch fix, you know, as consumers are actually going out for occasion or, you know, festival seasons are coming up um, and, um, you know, working uh, in, in the office. So we are seeing, you know, more of the uptake in customers buying uh, products uh, in, in, uh, uh, in these categories where they can actually uh, uh, use during the upcoming holiday season. I mean, how much do you expect to be returned this holiday season? I think a big question out there for so many consumers when we're shopping a little bit more online is what happens to our returns? Where do they go? How much waste then does that potentially create? What do you see? What do you, I guess, what kind of insight can you give us about what that entire process looks like? Yeah, I mean, there are, and once the returns are actually initiated by a consumer, there are three things that happens on returns. If the products are in good conditions, they're put back on shelf so that they can sold again. Uh, if they are slightly used or open boxes, then they are actually liquidated. Or um, if the product is not in a good condition at all, or in some categories like um, baby products or even in health and beauty products that you know open box cannot be put on shelf or sold again, those are actually go to landfill. So there is a significant impact of returns and reverse logistics that is involved behind the scenes for every return that a consumer initiates. 
For Narvar, and, and I, I should say that I have used your services many times as the customer of one of the companies that you partner with. What does that next leg of iteration of growth beyond a company being able to add kind of their own branding, their own experience into this logistical process that many consumers, uh, they, they continue to track their packages and, and take part in? No, absolutely. I think there are two things. When we're talking about returns, we talk about the cost. Um, and that actually impacts the bottom line of consumers uh, as well as for uh, retailers because consumers pay the price for paying for returns and retailers see that operational uh, overhead. So we're going to see a couple of things happening in the industry. First of all, today's returns policies are one size fit all, which means you have X number of days to return uh, either for a fee or, or at no fee. And then you, you can't do much. What we're going to see in the future is much more balanced uh, returns policies where, you know, if you are um, a loyal member or a VIP member for a brand, then you can have much more uh, liberal returns policies. You may get your ret return, uh, refunds instantly. And um, and uh, if, if you're not, then you may have to pay for returns. So that's one change that you will see that retailers will tie uh, returns more closer to their uh, loyalty program. That's number one. Other thing that you will see is, it's not just about the returns, but how do you actually drive the exchanges? Because if consumer has an intent and if they buy a product online and they want to return it because of um, you know, a fit or a size or a color, how do you give them convenient options to actually exchange? That way you can actually keep the share of wallet versus completely refunding uh, for that purchase that uh, that the consumer may have made. So we see a lot of uh, uh, opportunities for uh, businesses to actually improve uh, their returns policies. And last but not least, um, technology, especially new AI and language models will also actually offer more convenient options to actually figure out what consumer needs are so that when they are looking for exchanges that way, they can get a, a better fit uh, through the process. Just very quickly, we only have about 15 seconds. I mean, when you think about the capital that's necessary to run Narvar, I mean, the, the last round that I had seen, and correct me if I'm wrong, was back in 2019, which would suggest that there's not a ton of capital infusion that's needed to make sure that this continues to have wheels and, and run the same way that it needs to. Uh, you know, what is the kind of structure that you look forward? Do you, do you think about an IPO? Do you need to go public? I mean, uh, we are running our operations quite effectively. Uh, we have been both cash flow and EBITDA positive and really excited to actually deploy the cash and the uh, balance sheet that we have for future innovation and growth. So happy to come back and share all the excitement that we have <laughs> in the organization for our future growth here. I would love that. All right, Amit Sharma, Narvar founder and CEO. Great to speak with you here today. Appreciate you and the team uh, that you got over there. Uh, thank you for having me. Definitely. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance Live.
A tale of two food companies, J.P. Morgan has opposing viewpoints for Krispy Kreme and Dutch Bros, downgrading Krispy Kreme to neutral on execution issues, but they lifted Dutch Bros to overweight, citing liquidity improvements. When you take a look at their base case, at least here for Dutch Bros, they're saying that Dutch Bros now has strong available liquidity com comprised of $150 million of cash, $350 million of availability under its undrawn revolver, $200 million of undrawn delayed draw term loan here, all setting that up for turning uh, free cash flow positive in 2027. So the outlook here for Dutch Bros it's pretty optimistic comparing that to Krispy Kreme. It looks like the biggest issue, at least my takeaway from this note, was the lack of consistency that they're saying they're seeing around Krispy Kreme's delivered fresh daily business and some of the risk that that could then pose to the business going forward. I don't know. You are you were a pretty loyal Krispy Kreme uh, I was for a while there. Uh, well, it was proximity driven. I lived directly across the street from a shopping center which housed a famed hot light and Krispy Kreme, and so I could not help but go without... Uh, you know, or, you know, without a couple days or a week without uh, going in there. Anyway, all that the same. You love looking at the uh, kind of convection line as it's coming down. For all of these calls that we've seen come forward, uh, a few things about the consumer, especially in that delivered fresh daily, it's really just the opportunity to, to get them in a few different capacities. And, and Krispy Kreme here, I think within what they've been able to do in that delivered fresh daily is to just grow the network that they're able to deliver into. Now, this is also a company that's had a recent uh, CEO transition as well here. Mm -hmm. So Tattersfield out and now ultimately uh, seeing what that new um, head at Krispy Kreme does in order to continue to grow the network, ensure that the quality is is not, you know, um, ultimately given up in that effort as well. Um, and then on the Dutch Bros side, that's just been interesting to try and what JP Morgan is saying about them saying they see significant changes in, in capital structure and shareholder base in the past few months and that uh, really kind of contributing to some of the update there that the bank or the firm had given for this coffee chain. And there's a new elf. New donuts elf too. There Three is. new elf donuts to celebrate 20 years since we first started talking about Will Ferrell and Buddy the Elf. That's I amazing. think I've only seen the movie once. Really? Yeah. Oh. That's all I needed. We've got some big interviews on tap next hour. Stocks are higher to kick off a shortened trading week, but what we have seen historically ahead of Thanksgiving, that is the big question. Rochelle Kufo is gonna have that covered for you. And companies like China Xi'an have a low price tag, but how will this impact retail giants like Amazon this holiday season? Plus oil ticking higher today as traders await OPEC's next move. Stay tuned for a technical analysis with MarketGage.com's Michelle Mish Snyder. That's next hour. All that during the 11 a.m. All right, so a quick check of the markets here. Just about an hour and a half into the trading day. You're still looking at slight gains here across the board. You look at the major averages here. You have the Dow up 86 points, the NASDAQ up just about six tenths of a percent. On a sector basis, communication services, energy, and technology, the outperformers are so far today. That does it for us today. Keep it right here on Yahoo Finance. Rochelle Kufo has you for the next hour. We'll see you tomorrow.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufo. Here's a look at what I'm watching this morning. The mission continues. Sam Altman is heading to Microsoft. So what will the future of the company's AI venture look like now? We'll discuss. And companies like China's Xi'an have a low price tag, but how will this impact retail giants like Amazon this holiday season? We'll speak with an expert coming up this hour. Plus, oil is ticking higher today as traders await OPEC's next move. Stay tuned for a technical analysis with MarketGauge.com's Michelle Snyder coming up this hour. First, let's take a look at how the markets are trading an hour and a half into the trading day. Trading in a relatively narrow range, but still looking at some green across the board here. Something of a, of a tempered sentiment here as we await FOMC minutes tomorrow afternoon. You see the Dow there up about a third of a percent, about 100 points. The S&P 500 there also up about 0.4 percent. Tech heavy Nasdaq, their strongest gainer so far this morning, up about 100 points or 0.7 percent. Well, let's also check in on the action we're seeing with the Treasury market as we kick off the week as well. Looking at the shortest term yield, that's up about 0.4% on the day. We're still seeing the 10-year ticking up solidly there, up about half a percent on the day at 446. And the longest term 30-year yield, that's up about 0.4% as well. Well, investors are gearing up for a shortened week of trading after a third straight week of market gains. Now, historically, what has this Thanksgiving holiday week looked like for markets? We're joining us now with more is Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery with that breakdown. So, Jared, what can we expect? Well, Rochelle, historically, years and decades ago, Thanksgiving week was a hugely bullish time for equities. Now it's a little bit more mixed. So I have the S&P 500 historically, what it tends to do on each day of this week, along with the Nasdaq Composite and the Russell 2000. And the S&P 500, I'm going back to the early 60s, the Nasdaq early 70s, and the Russell, the late 80s. And as you can see, Monday is the weakest by win percentage there. You can see uh, less than 50% for all three of those indices. On Tuesday, things get a bit better. And then on Wednesday, that is when we have the highest win rate. And then for the entire week, you can see it is positive more than negative 50% of the time. Now, here's a different look. This is measuring the actual returns on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, and uh, for the whole week. And I should also mention that Friday is an abbreviated session. Of course, Thursday, the market is closed. But here we see for the S&P 500, on Monday, which is today. Historically, this is uh, a day of losses. And that's only the median that I'm talking about there. But uh, the average is also negative as well. You can see things turn positive for the rest of the week. Uh, for the NASDAQ, all four days, all four weekdays are positive. And then for the Russell 2000, Tuesdays tend to be negative. But you can see they actually have the highest uh, gains on average or on median. Uh, that's approaching about 1%. And then we can also dig into some of the sector actions. Action. This goes back to the year 1999, unless the sector has been created since then in a couple cases. But energy, by far and away, that is the best. That's up 1.5% uh, on a median basis going back uh, 30 years or so or 20 years or so. Materials is the second best gainer. Then we have Infotech, Consumer Discretionary Communication Services, although that's only a few years old. And then Staples up about half a percent. But you can see all of these have median returns that are positive. And so that's what we tend to get. Now, I'd close by saying we do have some outliers and some interesting things can happen. I remember 2009 in particular, there was a concern about Dubai and its debt deal getting done. Looked like it wasn't. The market opened up strongly in negative territory on Friday morning, climbed back into the green by the close. So just be on alert that if we do get some negative price action this week, it might just be a little bit of a fake out. But we'll have to judge it from there, guys. Thanks. Indeed, appreciate that. As people can sort of manage their expectations ahead that's, of Thanksgiving. That's what it's Thanks all so about, much. managing Jared, expectations. Jared. Indeed. Thank you, Jared. Well, speaking of expectations, after his abrupt exit from OpenAI, former CEO Sam Altman is bringing his skill set to Microsoft. Now, Altman will head the company's artificial intelligence research team. He will be joined by OpenAI co-founder Greg Brockman and a few other former colleagues from the ChatGPT startup. With more on what this series of major shakeups means for Microsoft and the AI industry at large, I'm joined by Vasant Dar, NYU professor of technology, operations and statistics. Thank you for joining us this morning. So first of all, talk about this timeline here. And given where we are in the timing of generative AI and the explosion that we've seen it have over, over the tech giants, what do you make of this move? You know, it is so bizarre what just happened. And it seems 
so poorly thought out by OpenAI's board, right? So, you know, one day they announced that, uh, you know, uh, Sam Altman's fired, then there's talk about maybe he's coming back and now he's hired by Microsoft, which, by the way, I think was a brilliant move by Microsoft. You know, I have to take my hat off to Satya uh, for, for making this move. It's al almost like a preemptive move to get the IP into Microsoft. And so we've been seeing some media reports of drawing parallels between Apple's uh, board firing Steve Jobs back in the day in 1985. Do you see the same parallels that OpenAI could perhaps, when you look at what happened with Sam Altman and any perhaps hope that he might, that he might come back victorious in the coming years? Well, I, I don't, I, I don't think there's a, I don't think that's a great parallel because, you know, I think there was some um, sort of fundamental differences between Jobs and Scully about the direction that um, Apple should take. Here, it's it's a bizarre sort of governance structure to begin with, right? Open AI is governed by a, a board, like it's a nonprofit entity. Um, and, you know, there's several sort of rumors. Uh, one is that, you know, Altman was talking to Middle Eastern investors, you know, he's basically a money raising guy, you know, maybe he was doing that. You know, then there are also concerns about safety, you know, that, you know, maybe he isn't sufficiently concerned about safety. All of these things seem really vague and somewhat weird. It's like, you know, Google back in the day, you know, saying we're going to do no evil and then actually not doing evil and not getting data. I mean, no business considerations trump anything else. And at this point, I think, um, you know, certainly Microsoft sees a move to, uh, sees the need to move quickly, um, you know, but it's unclear what was going on in OpenAI's board and what they were thinking. But clearly this was really poorly thought out because, you know, the IP resides in people's heads um, and there's little that the board can do about that. And we're still waiting to see the full fallout of how many people, you know, Sam may be able to take with him from OpenAI um, at this point. So what does this do in terms of resetting the landscape here? Now that Satya has made this move very smartly, very deftly and in a very short amount of time, what does this do to the, com the competition in the space? Well, I mean, you know, I think, uh, I, I think it sort of uh, further distances Microsoft from the competition, right? They, they made a brilliant move by you know, investing in open AI, you know, 49%, you know, give them access to the technology. But this move by uh, open AI's board actually gives them, you know, carte blanche to the IP, right? I mean, uh, Altman's going to go there, Brockman's going to go there. I, I bet a bunch of employees will go there because this is a sort of an area where relationships really matter, right? And people like working with people that they have had a good history with. So yeah, expect to see a fair amount of IP just sort of walk out and walk into Microsoft. So great for Microsoft and sort of, you know, further getting ahead of the competition in AI. Now, of course, heavy is the head that wears the crown. Now that now that Microsoft does have Sam Altman here, what does that mean in terms of expectations? Because it seems like already with, with OpenAI on its own, things were already moving in leaps and bounds from Microsoft. Does this put a lot more pressure on Microsoft? And but judging by what you've seen, can they actually live up to it? Well, you know, it's it's good pressure, right? Uh, you know, it's one thing when you have pressure and you're behind and you don't have the best people. It's another thing when you have pressure and you have the best people and you're ahead. So this is good pressure, right? This is, you know, it just mana from heaven just dropped into their lap here. So, uh, you know, I, I, I can see that Microsoft will be very happy with uh, what's, you know, playing out out there. So if you're another tech company and you're seeing this very quick reshuffling here, how are you viewing it? How do you even begin to compete now that Microsoft, as you said, has made itself so much further ahead than the others? Well, that's a great question. And I think, you know, um, there there is competition, right? There's there's moves towards, uh, you know, open source. Like a lot of people feel like AI should be open source. So in the longer term, we will see competition and we will see more pressure towards open source, especially when it comes to AI safety. So, you know, it remains to be seen whether uh, Microsoft actually embraces open source when it comes to AI, like the way they have sort of in general, right, which which is what Satya did, you know, he sort of moved Microsoft away from its sort of closed uh, proprietary architecture to, you know, open, you know, to Unix, open source, uh, you know, cloud. So, uh, you know, I, I think um, it'll be interesting to see how they move now that they have sort of, 
you know, complete control over the IP, you know, to what extent they uh, open it up. Uh, anyone's are guess there, at this point as any... to how they will and how, how long. And given the, the, the cloudiness surrounding um, Altman's exit from OpenAI, does that perhaps do any damage to, to, the, to brand Microsoft or perhaps what is left of OpenAI without, without Sam Altman? Where does it go from here? That's a great question. Uh, I mean, for one thing, I think OpenAI will be sort of visiting its governance structure, right, which is really kind of murky. I mean, I, I don't think people were aware about the extent to which it's controlled by a six person board, many of whom people don't even know, uh, right? So they have tremendous power. Um, and I think what this move has brought to light is sort of, you know, the fact that that governance structure needs to be revisited. And I'm, you know, I expect that's what they'll do in the weeks ahead. Well, certainly has been a big wake up call for them indeed. Thank you for breaking this down with us, Vasant Dar, NYU Professor of Technology, Operations and Statistics and host of the podcast, Brave New World. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thanks so much, my pleasure. Well, we're heading into an abbreviated holiday week of trading. A few key factors could determine the fate of the market's three-week winning streak. Heavyweight Nvidia's earnings due Tuesday after the bell could be a make or break moment for the rally thus far. And investors eager for insight around Fed policymakers thinking will hopefully get some clarity from last meeting's minutes released on Tuesday. All this ahead, so what can we expect from the market heading into this holiday week and beyond? Joining me now is Ed Perks, Franklin Income Investors Chief Investment Officer. Thank you for joining us this morning. So as we set, setting aside what we've seen from OpenAI, this massive shuffle in tech over the past weekend, how does this set the scene for what we can expect this week? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, we you know clearly have a much quieter uh, holiday you know impacted week. Um, you know, to your point though, there are some kind of notable you know events happening in markets. We saw one you know clearly over the weekend, as uh, was just discussed. Um, you know, I think the bar is very high though for um, for companies like Nvidia, for companies like Microsoft. I mean, I just you know as we step back and look at you know the valuations of the sector now, clear, clearly they've been responsible for. The move in in equity markets. If you um, you know look at the average stock, look at uh, a lot of other sectors, a very different picture emerges. So um, you know I think these companies have to continue to tell you know a pretty good story and uh, and really deliver on the very high expectations that exist uh, in the market today for them. And, and bringing into that then the magnificent seven, which obviously were responsible for most of the rally that we've seen so far this year, some of that filtering out to other sectors as well. But what, what are your estimates for how do you see the Magnificent Seven faring from here? Yeah, we, we think they're really kind of towards the upper end of the, their range, um, you know, in the, in the near term. Um, so we don't expect a lot of leadership from them. We, quite frankly, haven't really had it in the second half of this year. Uh, it's very much a tale of two halves to us in the equity market. But, you know, with the trajectory of, of the economy here, you know, our expectations at least next you know, two to three quarters in particular, where, you know, we'll continue to see a little bit of a, of a more macro slowdown, a little bit more of an impact from, you know, the Fed's higher for longer, the other uh, factors that have contributed to some of the financial tightening that, that we're seeing. You know, we think it's very much a, a time for the Magnificent Seven to, uh, to once again, to deliver on the very high expectations and maybe to, uh, to grow into a little bit of the valuations that just, uh, you know, absolutely surged in, in 2023. And Ed, I know you mentioned some of perhaps a slowdown here, but are we, could we be heading into correction territory once the market sort of settles into a lot of the, the Fed's efforts and the continuing tightening credit conditions will sort of really start showing up more so next year? Yeah, and, you know, that's where we really are firm believers that a lot of the tightening that happened really didn't hit until very early this year. And, and then we had a, a very significant pause uh, and the, the response to the banking strains we felt in March was actually injecting a lot of liquidity, both from the Fed as, as well as from the Treasury. You know, by June, July, that started to unwind again, and, and we resumed this move to restrictive. And, and so, you know, we think this lagged effect of monetary policy tightening um, is really hitting the economy now here in these next couple of quarters. So, um, you know, we wouldn't be surprised if um, the range that's been established, once again, on something like the S&P 500, because of the Magnificent Seven, we feel like we're, you know, maybe at the at the upper end of that range in the near term. And uh, and we could see some, you know, some renewed volatility. You know, our, our view is that markets really price in uh, pretty close to a Goldilocks scenario. 
uh, right now, whether we look at uh, the equity markets or even turning to the, the bond market, the expectations for interest rate cuts in 2024, you know, really are focused on, uh, look, disinflation is going to continue. The economy will grow, but won't fall into a recession. Uh, and the labor market will weaken, but not overly so. It's 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 a pretty rosy, rosy scenario. We think uh, and any uh, pressure more on the downside, you could see markets uh, react a bit more negatively, certainly on the equity market. And you mentioned the bond market, which, of course, has been a, have been on a tear. Some pullback, though, um, in recent weeks here. Have people missed the boat? Is it too late to get into the bond market? Or how are you playing the bond market right now? Yeah, we don't think it is. You know, as we look at uh, particularly higher quality investment corporate bonds, uh, still very attractive yields in the very high fives, even low 6% range for uh uh, for for uh, securities like that, you don't need to take a tremendous amount of duration. We think you can look in more of the uh, intermediate part of maturity. So we, we like things in six, seven, eight year maturities, uh, trading at discounts to par value. Once again, the, the most attractive yields we've seen uh, in several decades in that asset class. So we don't think it's too late. Now, if we get another shot with the 10 year treasury uh, up closer to 5%, um, you know, we'd certainly be very focused on taking advantage of that opportunity. Uh, quite frankly, we don't think we're going to get it. And and uh, and looking at the asset class, uh, where it is today, we, we find it attractive. And of course, coming to the tail end of earnings season, it's been it's been interesting. I feel like the expectations were were relatively low and they were met. What's your big takeaway from where we're coming out of this earnings season, especially a lot of the warnings we heard about the slowdown in the consumer? Yeah, there's a lot of areas that I think we can point to in the equity market that are tied more to that consumer where, you know, the trend that we've seen these last three to four quarters, which uh, initially started as a contribution uh, to the profitability growth coming from both volumes and pricing, as we move forward through 2023, it became uh, more and more difficult for many companies to deliver on volume growth. And, and they really have leaned much harder on the ability to pass pricing on to their customers. We think that's getting very long in the tooth. Uh, and as we move into 2024, uh, expectation should be that that growth will be harder to find, both on the unit volume side because of the macro slowdown. And uh, quite frankly, the, the ability to price uh, push price increases through is just getting more and more difficult for many companies. Certainly, we'll have to be a lot more discerning heading into 2024. Appreciate you joining us this morning. Ed Perks, Franklin Income Investors Chief Investment Officer. Thank you so much. All right, coming up, Xi and Timu TikTok. Oh my, find out how Chinese companies are taking online retail by storm. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there is more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance.
Retail results are far from over. We heard from the big box stores last week. Now we'll get some insight into some smaller specialty retailers. Here with what we can expect is Yahoo Finance reporter Josh Schaefer. So Josh, what's on your radar for this week? Yeah, Rochelle, we got a holiday shortened week, of course, with Thanksgiving on Thursday and half a market day on Friday. But as you can see here, quite a bit to go through before we get to that turkey First, starting with Tuesday, really is going to be the big day of earnings this week. You got Best Buy, Dick's Sporting Goods, Lowe's, and NVIDIA is going to be after the bell. But let's focus on retail first, for Rochelle. And I want to take a look at some of the stocks here on the Wi-Fi Interactive that we've been watching in the retail space. So what we have here is a five-day look at retail and just stocks that gain the most. So you can see some of the big winners from last week. Gap, up almost 40%. Macy's, also up almost 40%. And the reason we've seen these companies take these big jump up in the last week after they reported was really a lot on margins. It was not necessarily about these companies having blowout sales. We heard a lot about demand from companies like Walmart maybe not being as strong as one would hope, but it's been a story of margins. Can companies get margins back into a place that they're comfortable and a story of inventory? So that's what we're focused on this week when we think about some of the companies we're going to hear from, like a Dick's Sporting Goods. You remember last quarter, Dick's, they warned about retail crime. They didn't have good margins last quarter. Big jump down for the stock there. Will that, will that come up in the call tomorrow? Something we're looking for. And then you take a look at Best Buy. Best Buy, a company obviously sells consumer electronics. They've been struggling a little bit with demand in that consumer electronics space because it's discretionary. What did they say about demand tomorrow is one thing I'm looking for. And then just a friendly reminder too, of course, when we think about these companies and you think about how these stocks move, take a look at Macy's. You saw that big jump, year to date, it's down 28%. So be thinking about how these companies' stocks have performed coming into the report, and that might dictate what we see as well, because we know some of these beaten down stocks have been where people are buying over the last week. Yeah, that context is going to be important, especially as we watch for the stock moves after those earnings reports. Now, of course, we'll also hear from NVIDIA this yeah. week. How important are these results? I mean, Rochelle, you really can't play up how big, you can't overplay how big this could be for the market overall. We take a look at the NVIDIA chart this year. Obviously, the stock has been ripping 240% as we've really grabbed hold of that AI narrative. And you see these little blips or these big blips that we've seen, right? These big bumps up in May, big bump up recently, where we went sort of sideways here and a little bit up was also when the market went sideways and a little bit up. NVIDIA has really sort of driven the stock market this year. I'll show you the NASDAQ just to give you an idea of what I was talking about there. If I can get it up. And maybe I can't, so that's okay. But overall, when you take a look sort of just at how the market has reacted this year, it's really followed NVIDIA's case. You see the big jump up in May. You see it go relatively flat as NVIDIA and the MAG7 went flat. And then NVIDIA has been closing in near an all-time high. So as NVIDIA has moved, as those Magnificent Seven stocks have moved, the stock market has really moved. So we're looking to see if they meet the high expectations come Tuesday. And we know those expectations are high indeed. Appreciate you breaking that down for us, our very own Josh Schaefer. Well, are U.S. consumers flocking to Chinese e-commerce for deals this holiday season? Well, on TikTok, hauls from the fairly new Chinese e-commerce brand Timu have picked up where the Shein craze left off. Consumers boast about getting huge deals on products that they may normally find on Amazon or in stores for higher prices. On Timu, you can find backpacks for $3, socks for $0.80, cents, and even smartwatches for $10. Now, as the consumer gets more cautious, could Amazon and Walmart be losing share to these low-cost Chinese retailers? Let's bring in Reuters reporter Ariana McElmore for more on this. So, Ariana, break this down for us. Give us some context here. How are they doing market share-wise, these Chinese e-tailers and retailers versus the Amazons and the Walmarts? Absolutely. So when you have Shein and Timu, they're really great for stocking stuffers. Think makeup, think um, toys and smaller electronics, things that are under $20. But for Amazon and Walmart shoppers, they're looking for TVs, they're looking for iPhones, they're looking for tablets. So when it comes to competition between the two, those consumers are looking for totally different things. And at the end of the week, we have Black Friday. So there's a lot more time between getting your, your presents and getting them under the tree. Now for those last minute shoppers, you're gonna see those shoppers go to Amazon because you know they're banking on that one day and two day shipping, even though um, Shein and Timu shoppers may be looking 
for those lower prices. So it's really all about a give and take. It's true, because especially when you think about holiday shopping, that timing very important, especially if you left something till the last minute. Um, now, we were showing mm -hmm. some, some TikTok clips there. Talk about the mm -hmm. marketing around the holidays when it comes to how successful Shein and Timu have been. So Shein and Timu, they know their consumer. They know it's teenagers. They know it's um, Gen Z. So you'll see a lot of their marketing on TikTok. You'll see a lot of their marketing on social media. Um, Shein has also made a push for marketing you know, um, in Times Square, they did a pop-up uh, earlier in November and Shein is known for doing pop-ups across the country. So marketing is a big play. Um, when it comes to Walmart and Amazon, you'll see a lot of Walmart marketing, you know, on TV, on your streaming channels. Amazon has been huge on marketing within its app and on its streaming platform. So again, each each platform knows who their audience is. And when it comes to Timu and Shein, they know that younger consumers just don't have as much money as, you know, maybe their parents. So that's where they're meeting their customers. And I'm certainly getting lots of lots of links from my daughter about things that she wants from Shein and Timu and other things. And I'm just like, oh, she, yeah, I, we'll see. Slow you slow your roll a little. But um, <laughs> I want to talk about something that we've seen, which is Shein's... Um, you know, now we're seeing Shein in Forever 21 stores. Talk about the strategy there and how that really helps Forever 21 as they perhaps try and capitalize on some of the momentum from Shein as well. So I think that is a really interesting play, right? Like we haven't heard anything from Forever 21 for years. It was huge when I was in college, um, huge when I was in high school. But after that, you know, you didn't really hear anything about it. So now that they've they have this partnership with Shein and they're getting more eyes on the platform and in the stores. They're really hoping to get a boost from this partnership. Now it remains to be seen on whether this is going to work or not. Right. Um, you also see Shein acquiring Misguided, which was also very popular, you know, in 2013, 2014. And so you see Shein taking all of this market share from these fat, other fast fashion companies. Um, and it's going to be really interesting to see, you know, if Gen Z kind of pivots to the Forever 21s or the Misguided. Um, I think that Shein's going to have a long way to go if it wants to beat the likes of Amazon. For example, Shein between January and September was able to rake in $24 billion. Now for Amazon, their online revenue sales were 53 billion. So like I said, Shein has a long way to go if it wants to beat the likes of Amazon. And I wanna ask about Amazon excluding Timu from its competitive price checks. Talk about the strategy there because a lot of people are wondering about, you know, are the, are the standards the same? Should they be included in the same, in the, in the algorithm in the same way? So, for Amazon, they are worried about the quality of goods. They're worried about counterfeit goods. And for them, their position is that they don't want to compare their merchandise to something that may not be up to par for their standards. Now, it it's up to the consumer to say if that's fair or not. But I think for Amazon, that's going to keep a lot of their merchandise still on their platform without having to worry about, you know, removing some of their, their marketplace sellers who may be getting their products compared to, you know, the Timus and the Sheehan's. True. Plus, at the end of the day, you always have to check the reviews because, you know, right. no, no matter where you're shopping, it's the, it's the reviews that will really tell you what you're, what you're actually getting for your money. I appreciate you taking the time yeah. to join us. Reuters reporter Ariana McElmore, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, coming up, oil prices snap their losing streak. Michelle Schneider breaks down the recent oil moves. Plus, do you need a smaller turkey? How a Zempic and other weight loss drugs could impact your Thanksgiving dinner next.
Oil prices are edging higher after a four-week streak of losses. Now, this comes ahead of an OPEC Plus meeting this weekend. The big question, will members, including Saudi Arabia and Russia, commit to further supply cuts? Well, according to a report from Reuters, the cartel's members are considering it. So what can we expect from the oil markets ahead of the meeting? For more on this, Michelle Schneider, MarketGage.com chief strategist, is here. Good to see you, Mish. So... We've been in an interesting time here. I know in your last note you had oil the new gold buy, buy when there's blood in the street. Does that still hold ahead of this OPEC plus meeting? Well, certainly it was the case last week, Rochelle, when everybody got so negative on the oil because there was a 20% drop. And I think that's what's so dangerous when you talk about any commodity, particularly over the last few years when commodities have become all the rage is not understanding the volatility that commodities bring to the table. And 20% corrections are not unusual. Volatility is not unusual. So the reason why I mentioned it as the new gold is because what we've seen with gold recently was also a huge drop, about 20, 25%. Everyone left it for dead. And then whammo, it's when there's blood in the streets, gold continues to then get a bit. And the same exact thing happens. So there's fundamental reasons for why the oil is up here. What we don't know yet is those same fundamental reasons going to be a reason why we can get back up over 80 to even $90 a barrel. We could just be ranging right here. And what would that range look like? I mean, as we look at WTI right now, it's currently at $77.86 a barrel there. But we know at one point we were looking at expectations of $100 to $150 a barrel by some calls by the beginning of next year. How do you see the oil market playing out from here? Well, there's so many factors. So let's talk about it. You mentioned OPEC plus at the beginning, and that's clearly going to be a factor. There's BRICS. There's still a lot of talk out there about pricing oil and something else other than U.S. currency. That, of course, would have its own implication. There was obviously stress because people thought last week we were heading into a recession, labor going down, housing going down, some of the manufacturing numbers not showing so robust. People were saying the demand is done. And of course, gas prices have come down a lot too. That's also been a weather factor and and huge supply there. But the supply in oil is still iffy besides the OPEC. We also have the floating storage rates, and that's how much crude is actually on floating storages throughout the seas is at a two and three quarter year low. But I think one of the most important things to keep your eye on here in terms of what's going to happen with oil prices is the SPR. And what's right now, the the, the, the U.S. has not necessarily refilled what they were supposed to. They were looking at $70 a barrel. It got down to 72, which is why I thought my turn. But also they're looking at sour crude and people keep talking about W2I and sweet crude, but sour crude is really what is essential in heating oil and in diesel. And there isn't a lot of that. So we have these outside of the geopolitical risk, obviously, we have these other factors that could keep oil at least trading, I'd say above 70. And maybe we can get to 100 if something more catastrophic happens. But I'm not looking for big moves there. To me, the future of inflation is coming more from food. So then for people who are interested in investing in oil, what mindset should they have? Because you mentioned the volatility and expectations there. Well, it's kind of similar to how you want to invest maybe in gold, in that you want to have a piece of exposure to at the energy markets and the oil markets with this dip. It gave a great buy opportunity with a lot smaller risk. But I wouldn't necessarily think that it's the greatest place to be right now. Like I said, I'm, we really have pivoted more into the whole food space uh, and some industrial metals. But I wouldn't have, I, we have actually a position in, in oil right now. It's a relatively small position and we have a stop. So that's how you have to play it. If I think if the oil breaks down under $70 a barrel, that would be the caution. If it holds here right now, it's at 77. So it's a little bit rich to the risk versus the reward. But you get any kind of dip closer to 74, 75, I'd take a shot. And I would look at what happens at 80. And then 80 to, to 90 can happen very quickly. And some of the commodities you like in the food space, and I've been tracking uh, what we've been seeing with cocoa prices especially, what are some of the ones that you think people aren't paying enough attention to? 
Well, you mentioned cocoa. So that went as high that it hasn't been since 1978. So think about that. There's been a lot of comparisons about the 70s and currently. And that's a great classic example of one. Sugar, people, there's reports about sugar out there. But to me, sugar is still the key barometer of what we can expect with inflation going forward. And so right now, sugar has been trading over 27 cents a pound, and it's not taken out its recent highs, really kind of where it's trading at right now. And I think if that starts to break out, that would give us another opportunity. If you, again, follow the 70s, by 78, 79, sugar was up at 40, 45 cents a pound. And soybeans, soybeans are another one. We had a good crop here in the US, but Argentina and Brazil are having tremendous drought. And now with a new president in Argentina, it's gonna be interesting to see how much he wants to move the economy. Um, and so I think soybeans and the whole DBA agricultural ETF, those are the areas that I'd be looking at mostly. I appreciate your insights as always. Great having you on, Mich Michelle Snyder, marketgauge.com chief strategist. Thank you so much and happy holidays. Happy holidays, Michelle. Well, Thanksgiving is in just a couple of days, and one of the biggest eating days in the United States. But with the rising popularity of weight loss drugs, is a lighter holiday season to come. Well, the use of GLP-1s like Ozempic and Wegovy is skyrocketing, with hundreds of thousands of prescriptions written each month. Now, the drugs are typically prescribed for those with obesity or diabetes. But even without those conditions, nearly half of the people interested in the drugs, that's according to AKFF's poll. Now, the explosion of weight loss drugs are leading many food companies to address them on earnings calls. And it's not only food focused companies, the health industry also seeing a ripple effect in the conditions that the drug can treat and even cure. Now, this is a growing industry. It's estimated to make about $100 billion in sales by 2030. Well, will this Thanksgiving be the canary in the coal mine for how Americans' eating habits are changing because of these weight loss drugs? Or is it just a whole lot of stuffing? We shall see. All right, coming up, cruise control no more. The CEO of GM's cruise steps down. What it means for the robo-taxi industry next.
shares of education technology company Chegg falling this morning on a Morgan Stanley downgrade, down almost 7% so far. The investment firm downgraded Chegg stock to underweight from equal weight. Josh Bayer, the analyst behind the call, saw weaker web trends for Chegg in the month of October and cited greater competition playing out from generative AI in the longer term. Bayer also cut his price target on Chegg to $9 from $10. Ultimately, the analyst believes the stock is creating an unattractive risk-reward scenario for shareholders and says the company's fourth-quarter guidance expectations are too high. The stock being punished today as a result. Well, Cruise CEO and co-founder Kyle Vogt resigning from his role over the weekend. Now, this comes weeks after the company, a subsidiary of GM, suspended its autonomous operations after several traffic incidents, including an accident where its vehicle dragged a woman more than 20 feet. For more on this, Yahoo Finance reporter Pras Subramanian is here to break all of this down. Hey, Pras. Hey, Rachel. Yeah, so Kyle Vaught, he tweeted out last night that he was leaving the company, uh, you know, as far as crews halting its operations, its autonomous operations across the country and recalling its vehicles for a safety issue uh, and had its permit, remo- remo- uh, permit revoked in California, all based on that on that one major accident there in San Francisco where a woman was was hit by a uh, hit and run driver, launched into the intersection and then cruised, drove a taxi, hit her, ran over her and dragged her. So not very good there. So in an internal email, Kyle Vaught said to employees, this is uh, secured by Reuters, that he said the company veered off course during his leadership and there was no sugarcoating what happened. So pretty, uh, Pretty uh, sad there for what's going on with Cruise. Not sure what's what's left for the company going forward. Probably a pause there, and then we'll see if they can sort of reform it. But bottom line, this is a another black guy for the self-driving tech, autonomous tech industry. You had Argo AI backed by Ford and VW uh, getting shut down, and then of course Tesla's FSD, uh, various investigations there with the with NHTSA and also the DOJ as well. Well, certainly some of those enthusiastic timelines we heard from the likes of Elon Musk about when we'd be getting fully autonomous driving, you know, widespread out here, not not living up to it. But in terms of what this means for GM, when you add this to what's already been happening for the company, where do things stand? You know, GM this year had started off on the on, on the on the on a, on a right step here, right? Had had really good earnings first, second quarter. They they boosted their profit guidance uh, forecast both times, but then. In the back half of the year, some issues, right? First off, you had the the UAW strike, uh, that shutting down production for more than six weeks, and then GM having problems there, getting their deal ratified. A lot of workers, older workers, not happy with the deal. Eventually, they got that squeak through. The, the members there uh, approved it, so that's passed them. But they took a big, you know, big hit from from Q3 earnings. About uh, Paul, see if a Paul Jacobs Jacobson said that earnings were hit by 800 million bucks in Q3. That was as of the end of October, so there's going to be more of an effect there. And then we also saw them push back their EV plans. Um, they delayed a factory conversion in Michigan that was going to build some some EV pickups. They delayed that till 2025. They've cut their their targets for where, what they see in terms of EV production. Um, they they then uh, reduce what they see as, what, as how much they're going to build by 2025. And, and then uh, combined with what happened with the crews today uh, or over the weekend, you see sort of three big headaches this year. And for the stock, it's, it's down a lot this year compared to the market. The question is, can CEO Mary, Mary Barrett get things right, get going in 2024, 2025, uh, get the stock where it needs to be compared to its competitors? Indeed, we'll keep watching that and obviously see how the additional bites of those additional you know, labor costs they incurred as a result of the strike add up as well. Great stuff. Proud of Romanian. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, coming up, get your shopping carts ready. We're just a few days away from Black Friday. But what are retailers saying about expected demand? We're taking a closer look next.
All eyes are on the retail giants this week, with Black Friday just around the corner. But several companies warned on a weaker consumer this holiday season. Yahoo Finance's Brooke De Palma has the details. Brooke, I know, I, I'm, I'm all shopped out already and it hasn't even started yet. I, I just can't be bothered this year. Rochelle guilty as charged as well. I've been shopping for deals all weekend, but despite looking for deals, it's no secret that consumers' wallets remain pinched. And they're becoming, just like me, more and more mindful of just how much they're willing to shell out this holiday holiday season. In recent earnings report, both from Walmart as well as Target, we got an inside look into the state of the U.S. consumer. And Walmart CFO John David Rainey also joined Yahoo Finance to share what's happening right now ahead of their biggest time of year. We've seen consistent growth, pretty consistent each month of the quarter in most categories of our business. As we got into the back half of October, we saw that slip a little bit. And sometimes that can be related to unseasonal weather, could be related to other things that are happening in the economy. And so we called that out uh, because it was a little bit different than what we've seen for the first part of the year. That said, as we look into November and particularly around some of the events that we've had for our holiday shopping, we've seen pretty good strength. And so what that tells me is that the consumer is being discerning, maybe choiceful. And in years past, despite warmer temperatures in the fall, consumers would still stock up on winter apparel ahead of the colder season. But now we're not seeing that as much. And Target shared a similar story. CEO Brian Cornell shared some headwinds up against the consumer on its third quarter earnings call. Take a listen to this. Overall, consumers are still spending. But pressures like higher interest rates, the resumption of student loan repayments, increased credit card debt, and reduced savings rates have left them with less discretionary income, forcing them to make trade-offs in their family budgets. And what we're really seeing here is both retailers leaning very heavily into value offerings and inventory management. They want to make sure that what consumers want and what they're budgeting for is ultimately in store and also at the right price. And so, Rochelle, as we both said at the top, we've been looking at deals all weekend. We've been looking for the best bang for our buck, and I'm sure we're not alone. Indeed. I know I was out there looking as well. Didn't find anything I, I loved that was worth us splashing out on. But Brooke, there's also been that one space that consumers aren't shying away from spending big on. What's that? Yeah, Rochelle, that's beauty. We're not shying away from spending more to make ourselves look good. In terms of Macy's and Target, those are two retailers that we heard from last week where we saw growth in beauty sales. Now, what's amazing there is that Macy's and Target both reported sales declines, but they did say that they saw strength in beauty. Now, from Macy's, they also have that cosmetics business, Blue Mercury. They noted continued strength there. And Macy's also pointed out the strength in fragrances and Prestige Cosmetics and Target, they have that Ulta Beauty business they acquired or rather launched back in 2021 in stores. And that's been showing strength for them as well. Now, what this ultimately all means is when I spoke to a consumer psychologist, there's two things. Wall, uh, consumers' wallets are pinched right now, but she's calling it the two for one effect. So they're saying, hey, if I buy beauty, uh, beauty items going to make me look good, which ultimately makes me feel better. And in turn, it makes consumers feel like they're spending less on those bigger ticket items that we know consumers are shying away from. And so in this sort of economy, we are seeing beauty sales remain strong. And it'll be interesting to see if that continues. But we know that's always been a bright spot when consumers see a downturn. It's true. A little, little cheap pick-me-up, little something that, exactly. that you can splash out on. Uh, Brooke DeFarmer, thank you so much. All right, well, let's get your final check of the markets as we head into the noon hour. Seeing some buying action picking up here. Currently, the Dow up about 117 points. The S&P 500 also up about 0.4%, about 20 points, led by the tech sector. You're also seeing the tech heavy Nasdaq there up 107 points on the day. No surprise that our top trending ticker, Microsoft, after that news of Sam Altman heading over there from OpenAI. Well, that does it for now. I'm Rochelle Akutha. I'll be back with you at 11 a.m. Eastern tomorrow. Stay with us on Yahoo Finance.